if you were an early adopter of the Wii U and you were bored, <laughs> Why? I can't imagine. You must have been in a coma or something, which would be the worst thing to deal with during prime Wii U hours. Oh, man. I told him he shouldn't get stabbed. Yeah, the thought of being bored by the Wii U is as preposterous as anyone, especially me, being in a coma. <laughs> How could I be in a coma? How could you be bored? Now alongside your Wii U, you could pick up a few accessories like the Wii U Pro Controller for 50 bones. Yeah, $50 to use this, or more appropriately, sit in the same room with. Because why can't I use this with Batman Arkham City, or New Super Mario Bros. U, or Epic Mickey 2? It supports the classic controller Pro from the Wii of all things, but no Pro Controller, which Baffles me! This was just as expensive as any other standard controller at the time, yet wasn't supported like one. Sure, it was more common for games to use it than the classic controllers on the Wii, but I still feel that Nintendo viewed this more so as a niche side thing to offer rather than a legitimate alternative to the Wii U gamepad. But over time, it's obvious they started to embrace it a lot more, with Mario U getting an update to enable support a few months later. Which is really great, because many love this thing. Much like how many love elder abuse. The Wii U Pro Controller is like bestiality. I don't like it. Alright, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, this guy has all the makings of an excellent controller. A great D-pad and buttons, good sticks, a comfortable shape that fits well in the hands, an 80 hour battery life, a surprise visit at work- WAIT! 80 hours on a single charge? I'm not even sure you can physically use a Wii U for 80 hours. And hey, it uses a mini USB cable to charge, which automatically puts this leagues above the Wii U gamepad's proprietary AC adapter. Everything about this seems to be a winner. What's your definition of winning, by the way? It better be this. They put the damn thumbsticks on the top and the buttons on the bottom! Oh. Oh, so, this follows the format of the gamepad, with the sticks both on the top, which, in my opinion, works for that due to the size and shape of the thing. But here, it just feels awkward to me. I, I don't know, it's a good controller, but this one element just rubs me the wrong way. Uh, plus, there's no motion control baked in here, no camera, micro phone, really, any of the fancy doodads in the gamepad, which is nice to have some peace and quiet for once, but makes it harder for certain games to support it. Still, a nearly essential purchase for the Wii U owner, alongside standard Wii remotes. Yeah, a lot of Wii U games sort of expect you to have these, and you can simply use your old ones on the new system, no problem, though Nintendo did re-release them in new Wii U flavored packaging. Only major difference with these Wii remotes is the sync button has a cutout on the battery cover, and you can press it with this tab on the wrist Trap. It's about damn time they didn't force me to take the cover off to sync my Wii remotes. I've had so many problems arise after doing that. Of course, Wii U games like Nintendo Land require Wii remotes for multiplayer, though you also may want them to use Wii mode. So buying a Wii U, I can still play Wii games, huh? Well, how does that work? It's just a Wii. You have to click on Wii mode, the Wii U basically resets, boots up again as a Wii with limited options. We don't have things like the photo, news, or forecast channels. Basically, just the necessities here. The Wii Shop channel still worked, which meant you could play old school virtual console games on Wii U at launch. They were just in Wii mode. You couldn't use your fancy new controllers to play anything here. You can't really do anything you couldn't do on a normal Wii. When they said the Wii U would be backwards compatible, I wasn't imagining this. It's like running Windows on a Mac. It's an elegant, but it's functional. It gets the job done. Plus, it gives us a Wii with HDMI. It doesn't really do anything to the games outside of a clear image, but it's still really convenient and my preferred way to play these things. You can transfer the contents of your Wii to Wii U via these migration applications showing Pikmin carrying all your data. Uh, see, that's the Nintendo I love, putting all the effort where it doesn't count. Now, I may be bleeding out, but they put the Nintendo logo on the HDMI cable. The Wii U, as a package, felt underbaked. There was fun to be had, but it lacked cohesion. The console featured a bunch of ideas, but none of them really working together, and many of them lacking substance, depth, polish, intuition, direction. It had promise for sure but it was buried underneath the clunkiness of an obviously rushed and poorly thought out product. The Wii U was obviously not lighting the world on fire like the original Wii did, 
though that doesn't mean it wasn't selling. By the end of 2012, the system had sold a little over 3 million units, which wasn't too bad. A decent start, all things considered. Meaning as we entered 2013, the Wii U was positioned to maintain its steady sales. But before we take a look at how many units the Wii U sold in January of 2013 in the US, I wanna take a peek at sales of mucus and see how that's going. <clears throat> wow, only 57,000 units in the month of January? That is rough for mucus. Oh, I'm sorry, mucus. After the launch buzz of the system died down, Wii U sales fell off a cliff. The lack of substantial content surrounding this thing definitely didn't help. A Nintendo TV arrived in December of 2012 and just wasn't this Christ figure Nintendo was hyping it up to be. It was fine, but as cool as some of these features are, you kinda had to go out of your way to use them due to how slow the Wii U was. You had to make an active effort to turn on the Wii U, boot up Nintendo TV, wait for everything to load up, all to select watching The Office in a slightly more novel way. A lot of these features were neat, but they weren't worth the hassle compared to just using a normal remote. TV was ahead of its time, but due to how clunky, sluggish, and half-baked the Wii U was, it just wasn't compelling to keep using, and it's obvious the service did not pan out how Nintendo wanted it to early on. Netflix wasn't a part of it until March 2013, TiVo and DVR support were promised but never came, and Europe just flat out never got Nintendo TV. It had some solid ideas and worked for the most part, it just wasn't life-changing like Nintendo thought it was, because while it aimed to declutter and simplify watching TV, it kind of did the opposite. Everybody watches TV like this. Nobody watches it like this. So yeah, contrary to what Nintendo thought, this did nothing to spike interest in the console. Neither did the games that released after launch. Uh, don't mind the second worst game of all time, according to Metacritic, releasing on December 4th, 2012 as a Wii U exclusive Family Party 30 Great Games Obstacle Arcade. But that didn't help things. That, alongside a handful of licensed games launched in December, but after that, nothing. All we really had were just a few indie titles like The Cave and Runner 2 on the eShop. And even then, that was pretty much it for indie titles. It was slim pickings. Rayman Legends was scheduled for February, Lego City Undercover and Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate in March. Uh, we knew Game & Wario, Pikmin 3, Bayonetta 2, Wonderful 101, and Wii Fit U were coming eventually. But like, that was all we knew at this time. There's some stellar titles in there, no doubt, but not enough to feel optimistic for the future of this system. It was obvious Nintendo had to do something to not only excite potential customers, but their current ones as well. So in came the Wii U Direct, a Nintendo Direct focused entirely on what Nintendo was cooking for their newly released system on January 23rd, 2013. See, now that's why I bought this system to find out why I bought it. So, how did Nintendo instill hope in the Wii U's future? Mention how a Mario game is coming. That was more likely than me waking up tomorrow. This was a monumental moment for Nintendo fans. This Direct featured announcements of a new 3D Mario and Mario Kart playable at E3 2013, alongside the first footage of Smash Brothers for Wii U and 3DS debuting there, the next Zelda game, a new Yoshi game by the makers of Kirby's Epic Yarn, Shin Megami Tensei Cross Fire Emblem, a new Wii Party, an HD remaster of Wind Waker, a new project by Xenoblade developer Monolith Soft, and all kinds of updates on games like Bayonetta 2, The Wonderful 101, the announcement of virtual console games coming to Wii U, system updates to cut back on the loading times. D this is like everything a Wii U owner ever wanted! Words! Yeah, a huge chunk of these announcements were merely saying this is gonna happen, and no gameplay, screenshots, working titles, really anything to go off of other than Mario. To be fair, at the time, this is all we really needed. Assurance. Just knowing these big games were coming, even if it was to be expected, it was nice. Though it does make this Direct really underwhelming to rewatch. I mean, you truly had to be there. A new 3D Mario was exactly what the Wii U needed to showcase this thing's capabilities. I mean, that's what Mario 64 did and what Mario 3D Land just did on the 3DS a few years prior. Mario Kart was a surefire good time. The Wind Waker in HD looked 
gorgeous. Even if all we saw were a few screenshots, that was all we needed to not only sell us on the game itself, but the prospect of HD remakes on Wii U in general. The concept of the next mainline Zelda game was intriguing as they were interested in rethinking the conventions of the series, a Yarn Yoshi looked irresistible, the Monolith Soft game X was one of the first real examples of an exclusive that looked to rival hardcore experiences on competitors' platforms with this huge open world and quality HD visuals. The Shimagami Tensei Cross Fire Emblem affirmed Nintendo's commitment to collaboration with third-party developers, and the Wii U Virtual Console was launching this spring with NES and SNES games supporting Wii U controllers, Miiverse communities, plus discounted pricing if you bought the Wii versions, and they kicked it all off with one game every month for half a year, costing 30 cents to celebrate the Famicom's 30th anniversary with Balloon Fight dropping right now. <laughs> It felt good to be a Nintendo fan this month, which made the execution in February more tolerable. Rayman Legends was scheduled to launch this month. It was going to turn a barren first quarter for the Wii U into that, but with Rayman Legends. This was looking to be one of the finest 2D platformers of the generation, uh, putting new Super Mario Bros. U to shame visually and creatively, especially when it came to use of the gamepad. Believe me when I say, most Wii U owners were looking forward to this one, and with nothing else really happening the first two months of the year, it was in a good place to get all the attention it deserved and then some. You can tell something happened instead, right? Close. Ubisoft announced mere days before its scheduled release that Rayman Legends was not only delayed to September, but was also not going to be a Wii U exclusive anymore. They initially said it was because they didn't want to disappoint the Xbox 360 and PS3 players who wanted to play the game oh so bad, they're so hungry. I have not eaten in weeks. It was later made evident that this was done due to the Wii U's slow launch and Zombie U's underperformance. Uh, Ubisoft didn't rip the exclusivity because of civil rights. In addition, Activision expressed disappointment in the system's launch. EA straight up said it wasn't next gen in one of the Wii U games that was non-stop talked about since reveal. The game that was said to have been best on Wii U, Aliens Colonial Marines, was rumored to have been indefinitely postponed for the console. Nintendo's response? <laughs> The Rayman Legends delay was the true start to all of these companies eventually abandoning Wii U. The launch did not meet expectations, and while I understand why that happened, some things just never added up. Ubisoft, because an M-rated first-person survival horror game didn't do well on the Mario Clown Box, you delayed the E-rated color explosion in the same genre as new Super Mario Bros. U. Yes, A Clockwork Orange did not screen well at this movie theater. We will cancel the Lego movie. Activision's disappointed in how their launch lineup went? I am too! Well, it wasn't all doom and gloom, as Nintendo held a Nintendo Direct this month, detailing mostly just 3DS software, though touching on some Wii U news. Most notably, a huge DLC expansion for new Super Mario Bros. U, replacing all the levels with brand new ones focusing on Luigi titled New Super Luigi U in celebration of the Year of Luigi. Sony's response that next week... Well, just you wait until LEGO City Undercover comes out. With new consoles on the horizon, all the excitement in gaming was aimed at them, especially when the Wii U didn't have much going on at the time. Though, let's not get ahead of ourselves here. We have a year to build up an impressive game library and make some jaw-dropping announcements to ensure when the PS4 launches, the Wii U will be sitting pretty next to it, featuring great games at an affordable price with a bright future. And while things seem bleak at times, we can't ignore the fact that Ubisoft announced Watch Dogs for Wii U this month. The game set to usher in the next generation of gaming, focused on hacking with smartphones, felt like a no-brainer with the gamepad, and come March 2013, we were officially escaping the quarter one drought and finally had some big releases. On March 18th, Nintendo published LEGO City Undercover. Finally, another reason to not buy a Wii U. I still don't understand why Nintendo went after this 
this game to make it exclusive. Uh, LEGO games are big, no doubt. Uh, but two reasons for that is due to the movie licenses and the fact they're everywhere. Sure, they're also fun and quality games that anybody can enjoy, but ripping these two elements away always made this game's existence as an exclusive strange to me. However, that doesn't mean I think it shouldn't exist. A good open world game for kids? When I was 10, I was itching for any kind of game that made me feel the way a Grand Theft Auto does. I think it's important to have kid-friendly alternatives in most genres, and LEGO City Undercover is an excellent one. You play as Chase McCain in this giant parody of everything. It's about as close to LEGO Shawshank as we'll get. It's super goofy and silly and stupid, but that's what makes it charming. It's like a big Saturday morning cartoon. The gameplay is a mix between any other typical LEGO romp and the mission structure of a Grand Theft Auto, which makes for a solid campaign, just not the most amazing sandbox, open world experience. You can't really screw around here like you can in GTA. But what you can do is wait to not really do that. LEGO City Undercover has some of the worst load times of the 21st century. Now, what do I consider a bad load time? Well, how about one that's been going on since I started talking about this game? They pop up all the time and can each last minutes. I'm not kidding when I say these nearly ruined the whole thing for me. But when I look past that, I see an open world game for kids and nothing more. It's good, but it's really nothing special. The cheesy plot and jokes definitely help elevate it, and it's not boring at all. It's just pretty basic. Doesn't help that the Wii U gamepad integration is sort of made out to be more than it really is here. Uh, you get a police communicator in game, which is supposed to represent the thing. It's front and center in the commercials, the back of the box words that as if using the gamepad is the main hook of the title, and it's like, it's a map. Absolutely integral. Could you imagine being in LEGO City without this thing? I can, but I won't. You do use it in certain instances to scan the environment, and when you get a phone call, it comes in through there, which is sort of cute, but at the same time, forcing these gimmicks takes away the ability to do off-TV play, use a pro controller, or do multiplayer with the two screens. In fact, LEGO City Undercover has no multiplayer whatsoever, which that's a staple of the LEGO game. So to not have that here, especially when the commercial shows a father and son sitting together and playing, it's just baffling. But setting these issues aside, I think I would be a miserable lump if I said LEGO City Undercover wasn't a solid time. It's a great kids game and a good game all around. It just is not a system seller. This is the kind of game that needs to be multi-platform. Now, why am I constantly holding this against the game? It was the first damn thing Nintendo announced for the Wii U. Like, was this supposed to be an oh shit moment? Now, if LEGO City wasn't your jam this month, there was thankfully a ton of other releases, most occurring the very next day. Here we have Monster Hunter 3 Ultimate by Capcom. Oh, nice, a big, meaty, hardcore action adventure game that looks like ass. This is an upgraded re-release of Monster Hunter Try on Wii, which that, in addition to this launching day and date on 3DS, meant this was never gonna be the greatest looker. And with the Monster Hunter series at this time being notorious for its lack of accessibility to dear God anybody new to the franchise, and the fact this launched on the least accessible game console at the time, <laughs> oh man, it's all coming together. This is a Monster Hunter for Monster Hunter fans. Now it's not only for them, but this game's main objective isn't to appeal to today's youth. It's to supply the best way to play Monster Hunter 3, and it does that. You can also link it to the 3DS version and transfer your save data back and forth, which you'd expect more games to connect like this? Like, wouldn't it have made sense for New Mario U and New Mario 2 to talk to each other in some way? The Wii U and 3DS share so many features, design elements, Parents? Why do my handheld and console communicate less now than they did back during the N64 days? I have my theories, and they're all right. Need for Speed Most Wanted You was another March 19th-er. Uh, while the game launched on 360 and PS3 back in October, this release made sure to make it worth the wait, as it features enhanced visuals, utilizing textures found only in the PC version. You know, sometimes it pays to wait five months to play a racing game without analog triggers at full price with most of the DLC not a Available. I never said it paid well. Much like most Wii U multiplats, this one has a few downsides, but 
that shouldn't stop you from accepting it as our Lord and Savior. Finally, the pros list isn't empty. They went out of their way to ensure Most Wanted took full advantage of the console, utilizing every last feature within reason, going as far as offering Wii Wheel support. But they were smart with how they implemented everything. They didn't just force you to accelerate with the microphone. We can use the screen here to select cars to switch to on the fly, plus use it in a new exclusive multiplayer mode to help out the player on the TV. And now, just for fun, they added Mario Warp Pipes to the map. This was a version of the game crafted out of love, and is easily the best game EA put out on Wii U yet. Can't wait to see what they do next. Me too. This was EA's last Wii U game. Shortly after this, they announced this year's Need for Speed, Battlefield, Madden, and FIFA were skipping the platform. But not the PS2. Listen. I get it, the Wii U was not selling great at the time, but if you were gonna get one, you weren't gonna buy Mass Effect 3 with it. This console wasn't appealing to the hardcore audience or the casuals. The only people buying it were Nintendo fans, and the only games they were interested in were Nintendo games. The audience EA's games appealed to either weren't on Wii U, or if they were, Playing EA games just wasn't something they were using their Wii U for. They probably had an Xbox or PlayStation as well. So taking that into consideration, it makes sense why EA stopped trying with this system. But did they ever to begin with? Every game they released was months old, missing substantial features, and priced at a full $60. Plus, most of these were series we already had on the Wii, so there really wasn't any excitement with finally getting them on a Nintendo platform. This was par for the course. And that's the interesting debate with third-party games on Wii U. Uh, people just flat out weren't buying them, that's a fact. But when they were barely advertised, missing content, and or overpriced, uh, yeah, these games didn't do great on Wii U. But they weren't great versions of the games to begin with, so what did you expect? Though to be fair, I don't really see a world where EA would put Battlefield 4 out on this system day and date with the other versions and it looks and runs perfectly, has all the content, is fully featured, and it actually sells. It's obvious in hindsight the Wii U was a lost cause, but in the moment, I don't think that's entirely why EA pulled out so early. They put FIFA 14 out on the Wii, PlayStation Vita, 3DS. You can't tell me FIFA would have done that much worse on Wii U. It's so strange how this company went from singing their praises of Nintendo and this console, nurturing an unprecedented partnership, to having no games in development by May of 2013, making April Fool's Day jokes, flat out calling the system crap. Something definitely happened with rumors pointing towards EA wanting Wii U to use its online infrastructure with Nintendo deciding against it. Uh, that would definitely line up with the concept of an unprecedented partnership. So that falling through coupled with the low game sales, Electronic Arts was out. But hey, who needs them? The Wii U. Yes, not only did EA pull all support around this time, but one of the biggest champions of the console as well. Gearbox Software's Aliens Colonial Marines was set to be best on Wii U. They weren't wrong. Activision continued with their support as usual, with games like The Amazing Spider-Man, Ultimate Edition, and The Walking Dead Survival Instinct. Yeah, we didn't get The Walking Dead game from 2012, the Game of the Year winner, the one that runs on iPhones. No, we got this one. This game actually has some cool ideas. I always found its focus on survival and gathering materials to be intriguing. But to be fair, I can convey those ideas through sock puppets and they're still cool ideas. They don't make for a good game. But hey, while well, most third-party games would come here missing deals, See, Amazing Spider-Man has it all included on the disc. A movie tie-in from June of last year, the Wii U, and has the best version. It's also the plate to the best lasagna I've ever had. That very next month, we got Injustice Gods Among Us to absolutely no fanfare. It's like this game was a damn ghost. We barely knew anything about the Wii U version until it launched. Uh, no previews, early reviews, or gameplay really, uh, which is strange considering it's fine. It's a competent version of the game, it launched alongside the others, and just missing a few elements, like compatibility with the mobile companion game, a lot of DLC isn't there, some modes aren't available, uh, same price. I appreciate them supporting the console, and this version plays well, but WB and Nintendo barely acknowledged its existence, and you charge full price when you're lacking a handful of features? Well, Injustice for Wii U did not meet our projections. Well, what the f***?
fuck were they? The big deal this month was the hard launch of Virtual Console on the eShop, which definitely wasn't as exciting as I think Nintendo was anticipating it to be. I mean, for one, we've already gotten a few Virtual Console games via the 30th anniversary campaign, and for 30 cents a pop, you launch Ice Climber for five bucks and expect me to respond with compassion and empathy? Sure, if we bought them on Wii, we could download the Wii U versions at a discount, but that's the thing. These games were all already re-released on Wii. Ever since this thing launched, I could play these games and hundreds more on my Wii U through Wii mode. I just had to go through more menus and couldn't use the gamepad. Having to wait this long to play Donkey Kong Jr. when you could already play Donkey Kong Jr. on Wii U? I, I mean, what were we waiting for here? The Wii U to load. The added features were nice, soft TV play for the classics. That was a big bonus. But when they look like this, is it really? The NES games looked really lackluster with washed out in dark colors, the image wasn't crisp at all, and they also just didn't feel great to play. There's a bit of input lag, not enough to ruin games, but enough to make playing Virtual Console on Wii U feel sluggish, which wasn't something I ran into on Wii. Now, in contrast, Super Nintendo games looked beautiful. Uh, though still felt a bit off to play. Uh, overall, uh, nice to have classic games natively on Wii U, uh, but I think this launch helped hit home why this wasn't going to be as exciting as previous virtual console efforts. Uh, firstly, Nintendo was going to drip feed us the same exact games we bought on Wii and on 3DS, again on Wii U, throughout the rest of the generation. Wasn't like we hadn't had access to these games for years and we're finally getting them again. Secondly, they only launched with two consoles. We had like five right when the thing released. Thirdly, it was just disappointing to me, okay? I was excited at the prospect of playing these classic games on the gamepad, and when I finally got them, I realized there was nothing to really be excited about here. These were the same games I could play on Wii mode on my Wii U, but they were just less responsive now. It was nice to have these games on Virtual Console. I did buy a fair amount of them, but all things considered, this was a pretty lackluster element of the Wii U. But outside of my dozens of problems, it was great! Donkey Kong 3? Ooh! But hey, while all these titles we have had more than enough access to for years, Nintendo decided to announce during an April Nintendo Direct that they were finally going to re-release Earthbound on Wii U Virtual Console. This was big. I mean, this was a game that was so hard to nab a cartridge of. It was a game that never got re-released outside of Japan. And for it to finally get anything, was pretty awesome. In addition, the Wii received a software update, upgrading it from slow as f to slow as shit. And overall, I'd say it was a pretty relaxed spring for the Wii U. And not barren, but not too awful much going on. <laughs> This news hit me like a truck, and a big one at that. While Nintendo was going to E3 2013, they were not going to have a traditional live on-stage press conference, instead opting for the Nintendo Direct format they've been toying around with as of late. Listen, nowadays, that's no problem. The norm for most companies, actually. But have you ever watched the Nintendo Direct from 2013? Wario. Hey, I still loved them, but to replace the press conference with it, that felt too far. We got so many electrifying moments at E3 by hearing the crowd's reaction, seeing these people go up on stage and proudly proclaiming f digital presentations. A lot of people view Nintendo's approach here as cowardly, with some misinterpreting it as them skipping E3 as a whole. It was seen that if Nintendo refused to go on stage, they weren't confident. They were scared about being compared to Sony and Microsoft. When in reality, I mean, we know how much better digital presentations can be now. You have a much better flowing event with none of the technical problems or fluff like dance numbers and a car. What you lose in excitement and flashiness, you make up for with a better overall experience for the majority of the event's viewers, and I think Nintendo realized that before many other companies. They just decided to assert their stance at a very odd time. The E3 you're gonna show Smash Brothers at and we're not gonna be able to hear the crowd's reaction? I think that was the biggest disappointment for me. Plus, the direct format wasn't refined enough at this point, and we didn't expect as much from them as we do today. These felt like investors' meetings for fans, and the idea of this replacing our E3, frankly, was a bit concerning. 
for more reasons than one. Yeah, right after this, Nintendo started to copyright claim videos on YouTube featuring gameplay of their titles, which made it less likely people were gonna make and share videos about Wii U games online. I swear, with these two decisions back to back in addition to all the previous marketing snafus, I felt like they were actively trying to do the wrong thing. Wailing. We got a few more releases in May, like Resident Evil Revelations, the HD console port of the 3DS game from 2012, Lego Batman 2, a year-old game lacking the DLC from 360 and PS3, Sniper Elite V2, a year-old game that's missing multiplayer in general, my god, and Fast and Furious Showdown. That's all me. Stuff to play, but like, I don't want just stuff. I want uncompromised experiences. That's something that doesn't feel like table scraps or a sympathy port. Well, for that, Nintendo held yet another Nintendo Direct this month. Now, 2013, they stuck to a roughly monthly schedule with these presentations, which was really cool but they frankly didn't have enough content to warrant a Nintendo Direct every month. I mean, they wouldn't shut the hell up about Game & Wario in half of these. Like, th does this really warrant this much coverage? With that in mind, this was sort of a calm before the storm Direct. They get some info out prior to E3, but some of that info was pretty massive. Turns out, Nintendo struck a deal. Sega will create three Sonic the Hedgehog games exclusively for Wii U. First one announced being a new Mario and Sonic at the Olympics. Thank God they like that one down. That would have been exclusive regardless. What kind of a contract is this? Obviously, the more interesting one was the next mainline Sonic game, Sonic Lost World. Unveiled via just this one image with a full-blown reveal trailer occurring a few weeks later. Oh, I was definitely all in for a new 3D Sonic on Wii U. Uh, with the last one being Sonic Generations, I was really down to see another game in that style. I mean, it had some amazing stages, both visually and layout-wise. It just borrowed a lot from the series' history. So I was excited at the prospect of a wholly original game like this. What I got was no. Yeah, so after Sonic Team stumbled upon a winning formula, they said, let's try something new. And what we got was Sonic Lost World, a weird looking Sonic game with abstract level design and simple colorful visuals that looked good, but not impressive like Generations. Obviously, they were just going for a different style, but at the time, I felt this oddly made the Wii U look less powerful than the Xbox 360. While this wasn't the game I expected, it still looked high quality, and hey, a third-party Wii U exclusive. That was enough to keep our chins up going into E3. Ah, oh, hey, mold. Here it was, E3 2013, where the next generation firmly kicked into gear. The recently unveiled Xbox One was going up against the PlayStation 4. Both had great showings with a ton of games, but Sony knew exactly what buttons to push. When they announced a price tag of $399 compared to the Xbox One's $499 and even the Wii U's $349, all after publicly embarrassing Microsoft over the controversial policies they were looking to implement with their console, people scrammed to pre-order PS4s. It was an electrifying few days, some of the most important in gaming history. And then there was Nintendo. I logged on to Nintendo's E3 website on June 11th and was ready to see how the Wii U stacked up against the next generation of gaming. Yeah, they had some streaming issues. I remember this thing stuttering constantly at such a low resolution with numerous others corroborating the problems. But as long as the games were there, it didn't matter, right? Okay, so on paper, Nintendo's E3 2013 Direct was incredible. I mean, 3D Mario, Mario Kart, Smash Brothers, Wind Waker HD, Bayonetta 2, X, the casual games, third party releases, Donkey Kong. Coming from E3s of the Wii era where we'd get like two, three games we'd care about, this was nothing but quality games the core fans love. The games you bought a Wii U for. However, while all these games look good, how we knew they were gonna be good, they weren't exactly what the Wii U needed at the time. Super Mario 3D World was revealed, and of course it looked good. But when Nintendo announced it as a new 3D Mario action game coming from the developers of Mario Galaxy, 
They had to have known how underwhelming this looks. This wasn't a big leap forward for Mario. This wasn't using the Wii U effectively. Uh, this was a sequel to Super Mario 3D Land on the 3DS, which was great, yeah. But that was more or less a new Super Mario Brothers game in 2D. And with 3D World introducing four player multiplayer, it once again looks like a new Super Mario Brothers game in 3D. But I think what hurt even harder was the reveal of Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. Not because of anything to do with the game itself, but rather the developer. Retro Studios was behind this one and they were responsible for some of the greatest Nintendo games of all time. The Metroid Prime Trilogy, Donkey Kong Country Returns, how they helped out with Mario Kart 7. So at this time, people were pulling their hair out in anticipation for what Retro Studios would do next. Turns out, they pulled their hair out out of anger instead. Donkey Kong Country Returns was incredible. However, not many people were asking for a sequel at this time. We just got Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D in May of 2013, with new levels included. The Yarn Yoshi 2D platformer was just announced in January. New Super Mario Brothers U recently came out and New Super Luigi U was releasing soon. Uh, this type of game, just didn't feel necessary at the time. It almost felt like Retro Studios' talents were being wasted on yet another 2D platformer on Wii U. And they've shown with the Metroid Prime games how they can make something so expansive and impressive and mature. Uh, whether it would be a new Metroid or a reboot of another Nintendo IP or something completely original, it didn't matter. That would have brought something new and different and eye-catching to the Wii U's lineup. Uh, but instead, we just got another 2D Donkey Kong. But hey, Mario Kart 8 looked incredible. Visually, this was top notch. Uh, with some incredible lighting, character models, and track design, uh, made even better by the new anti-gravity gimmick. Super Smash Brothers for Wii U and Nintendo 3DS? My lord, this was one of the best trailers Nintendo put together at the time. Uh, the reveal of Mega Man was unlike anything else I had ever seen. And the release date of 2014, well, at least that meant even during the driest of months, we still had Smash Brothers to speculate about. Bayonetta's gameplay reveal looked great. X continued to impress. Wind Waker HD, absolutely gorgeous. This was a good E3. And while I feel like the game lineup here was enough to validate the Wii U to those who had already bought it, it didn't validate it to those who had it. Like, oh man, as a Wii U owner, I'm gonna have all the Nintendo games I buy a Nintendo system for soon. 3D Mario, Mario Kart, Smash Brothers, Zelda. Uh, but to everybody else, this lineup is practically identical to the 3DS. So why would I spend hundreds of dollars on this thing when all of the big games coming to it had alternatives available on something that's significantly cheaper, that had games that didn't have alternatives available elsewhere in 2013 alone? The 3DS had Fire Emblem Awakening, Luigi's Mansion Dark Moon, Animal Crossing New Leaf, Mario and Luigi Dream Team, Pokemon X and Y, The Legend of Zelda A Link Between Worlds. And everything Nintendo announced for Wii U at E3 kind of just felt like HD 3DS games. But with that being said, Nintendo at E3 2013. There was a good handful of great games on the horizon. And if you wanted to take them on a test drive, Nintendo partnered with Best Buy to offer demo events for 3D World, Mario Kart, Donkey Kong, and Wind Waker. They were definitely confident in this lineup. And even though I thought it was incredibly safe, it was just really great to have core Nintendo games to look forward to, rather than making do with hearing about Game & Wario for over a year. Well, the wait was finally over, because on June 23rd, Nintendo published their second Wii U game this year, Game & Wario. Moving on. Okay, fine. It is the only Wii U game that released this month, so let's take a look at Game & Wario. I said Game and Wario. Similar to Nintendo Land, Game and Wario is a mini game collection, hell bent on making sense of this. However, this is based on the WarioWare series. A keyword being based on, because I'm hesitant to call this a WarioWare game. It features the same character, style, and humor, though instead of playing through hundreds of micro games one after another in rapid succession, Game and Wario is just a collection of 16 mini games, most of which. Stink! Too many of these experiences feel like web browser games or micro games from an actual WarioWare unnaturally extended. These ideas are cute in five second bursts, but when I'm playing them for 10 minutes straight, what was charming in WarioWare becomes pathetic 
in Game & Wario. That's not to say there aren't highlights here. Gamer features actual WarioWare microgames on the gamepad, but on the TV, you have to watch out for your mom hiding under the covers to avoid her. It's a really fun twist that does a great job showing how Wii U can make things, I wouldn't say better, uh, more so unique. Sketch is literally just Pictionary, uh, but that's the kind of game the Wii U was made for. I would have loved to see a whole standalone release for this thing. It's so much fun and works perfectly with this console. But for every gamer and sketch, there's a game that's fun but just uses the touchscreen so it'd be just as fun if not more so on 3DS, DS, iPhone, and iPad. And for every one of those, there's an uninspired game that uses the gamepad, but that's all it does. It isn't fun or interesting. It may have an idea at its core that you can say, well, that's a use for the two screens, but that doesn't mean it's good. And for every one of those, there's a copy of a game we already played in Nintendo Land. And for every one of those, there's junk! It's crazy to think how WarioWare's smooth moves on the Wii just had this endless list of ideas on how to use the Wii Remote with 200 microgames. Well, Game & Wario on Wii U, it feels like it's struggling to come up with just 10 plus uses for the gamepad. This isn't a bad game. The good mini games are really good. I still come back to Sketch to this day. Island is a blast to play with multiple people. A gamer actually uses the gamepad in wildly effective ways. A Pirates is a fun rhythm game. There's some great stuff here, but it's surrounded by so much fluff that it severely detracts from the experience as it ends up ruining what this game set out to do. This doesn't validate the gamepad. It doesn't show off all these crazy ideas on how to use it. If anything, Game & Wario shows that even Nintendo and the series known for making the most out of a wacky new controller could barely come up with any uses for this thing. And that is so concerning. This is the great Nintendo Land, honestly. A party game that oddly focuses way more on single player than multiplayer, which I would have preferred the other way around, obviously. There's some gems in here, no doubt, but that's only about 25% of the whole package. I love some games in Game & Wario, but I wouldn't say I love Game & Wario. Honestly, in June, you were better off just picking up New Super Luigi U instead. The Mario U DLC launched this month, and oh my god, I vastly prefer this to Mario U. For $20, you get pretty much a new game. Everything outside of the level designs is the same, but you can make the argument that's the deal with every new Super Mario game. And these levels are leagues above what we got in Mario U. They're shorter, but much harder, which I find far more compelling than, well, this is just a goddamn novel. Luigi's unique physics make the game way more enjoyable to me. The higher jump and longer airtime make pulling off platforming tricks really satisfying. The inclusion of Nabbit as a playable character is pretty cool. I love how every stage has a hidden Luigi in it. I genuinely always preferred this to the base game. I never 100% completed that, while Luigi U, I did on my first playthrough. Yeah, that's right. I think this is great DLC. For 20 bones, you pretty much get another new Super Mario Brothers in your new Super Mario Brothers, and it can really be considered its own game. Because it is one. Yeah, in August, Nintendo released a standalone retail copy of New Super Luigi U for 30 bones in this collectible green case. And yes, of course I bought this twice. Yeah, that's wrong. The summer of 2013 was mostly filled with those licensed kids games we know damn well at this point, with one of them being Disney's Planes the Video Game. Did you know Nintendo listed this as one of their big Wii U exclusives in a July Nintendo Direct Mini? Come on, man, this list looked fine enough without it. As a part of that same Direct, Earthbound finally launched on the Wii U eShop, announced via a slick launch trailer. They treated this as if it was a new game release. It was a big deal, and justifiably so. I mean, this was how tons of Nintendo fans, myself included, were introduced to Earthbound, and they made sure to make this a meaningful debut. Recreating the original strategy guide included with the game for the Wii U gamepad via the web browser. However, don't be fooled by that higher than normal price tag. This is just a virtual console game. They didn't change or add a damn thing, but they didn't need to. Because Earthbound is one of those special games, that once in a lifetime experience. And the fact it was finally brought back at this moment in the way it was, really helped this game to leave an impression on a whole new generation. I mean, we all heard of Earthbound at this point, and when it's the only thing that month to play, hey, why not? 
Sure, you re-released it on a console with a microscopic install base, but that install base is a passionate one. So you introduce them to a game with one of the most passionate microscopic fan bases out there, and bam, Earthbound now has 12 fans. Nah, this game was consistently at the top of the Wii U Z Shop charts, which was a joy to see. It proved that it doesn't matter how obscure your game is or how poorly it did initially, because all that can change with just one more chance. Mm. Yeah, a year after other consoles got it, Wii U received Angry Birds Trilogy because that's what the Wii U received, games. Why this took so long is beyond me. I mean, this is Angry Birds. This is the only home console with a touchscreen. Well, we gotta finish this before we release Angry Birds. This was actually announced alongside a suite of other Activision titles for Wii U in July, including Call of Duty Ghosts, which was relieving to see. Though really strange as to why they waited so long to confirm it was coming. They were so mysterious about it, which ended up making the Wii U version feel like an afterthought. I mean, I know it was, but if you wanted it to succeed, why wait to just end up saying it's coming to Wii U? There was nothing special about this thing you had to keep under wraps. If anything, this made it so then most people didn't even know a Wii U port of Ghost was happening. Well, once August hit, things started to pick up, most notably with, honestly, what felt like the first blockbuster exclusive of the year, Pikmin 3. Let's be honest, this is kind of the first actual big game from Nintendo for Wii U. I mean, their own releases were basic 2D platformers, mini game collections, or games they simply published. This was a deep single player experience with multiplayer modes and obscenely detailed HD visuals developed internally by the company, and I was stoked. I had played Pikmin 1 before on the Wii and loved it. I was praying that this game was going to get those fabled 10 out of 10 review scores, and everybody would not only pick up a Wii U, but finally give the Pikmin series the recognition it deserved by trying the latest and greatest game on the platform. Ah, great, it stinks! Okay, so maybe this wasn't the game to change everything, but to be fair, I think that was unreasonable to expect out of Pikmin 3. This game wasn't designed to be a killer app. It was designed to be the third Pikmin game. But let me tell you, it does that job wonderfully. Being one of the most original interpretations of the real-time strategy genre, Pikmin seems hard to comprehend by just looking at it, but once you start playing, it all makes sense, and I think Pikmin 3 is the most accessible yet, while also being the best. This game is magical. Much like previous titles in the series, it invokes the feeling of being an ant. The world feels so huge, when in reality, it's probably an aspirin and whip. Because of that, there's this childlike wonder to exploring in Pikmin. It captures your imagination, offering a perspective that showcases the beauty in the smallest elements of nature, which you just don't get in any other franchise. And the HD visuals of Pikmin 3 elevate this to a whole new level. On top of being just a gorgeous treat to the eyes, the higher resolution really benefits the Pikmin experience, making it easier to see all the individual Pikmin on screen or background elements far away. The core gameplay is Pikmin perfected. It combines the best ideas from one and two to create something that feels like a celebration of the series up until that point, while feeling fresh and new. Exploring the world by using the Pikmin at your disposal and using their unique abilities to defeat enemies, tear down walls, build bridges, and collect fruit to progress through the campaign couldn't be designed or feel any better than it is in Pikmin 3. And it's all on a platform that honestly feels perfect for the franchise. Well, as long as the franchise is happy. This game supports a ton of control methods, though my preferred one and Nintendo's recommendation is the Wii Remote and Nunchuck and gamepad. Oh, finally, a use for my feet. Now you're meant to leave the gamepad on a coffee table or on your lap and just use it for map stuff when required while controlling the majority of the game with the Wii Remote and Nunchuck, which is pretty much perfect for Pikmin. You can use just the gamepad with the dual analog sticks, which works perfectly fine. It's just the Wii Remote is damn fine. But this setup highlights that while the gamepad is useful here, it's because they put integral menu functions on it. When using it, the game basically pauses on the TV, which 
sort of defeats the purpose of two screens. If you can only use one at a time, you might as well make this all controllable via the TV. But I was never too annoyed by this in Pikmin 3. Honestly, the larger icons and touchscreen controls here do make this better than a normal mini-map, and overall, I think it's just hard to be annoyed at Pikmin 3 in general. The worst thing about it is that it's a little short, but even then, you have mission mode, which is super replayable, and bingo battle for multiplayer, an insanely fun twist on the Pikmin formula for two competitive players. Oh, this is just a lovely experience, one of Nintendo's finest games, a product that encompasses everything I adore about this company. Now, how can a game this good not possibly save the Wii U? It's Pikmin. It's a wonderful franchise that has its audience and consistently sells over a million units. But that's not enough to sell a system. It's a great addition to a game lineup, but at this point in 2013, this was pretty much the lineup. You can tell Nintendo struggled internally with HD development, as this, alongside numerous other 2013 games, were initially labeled as launch window releases, and they ended up coming in nearly a year after launch. This took way too long to come out. However, I'd say it was worth the wait. Now, if Pikmin isn't your thing, Ubisoft had you covered. Man, I hate Pikmin, but I love Ubisoft. Okay, well, I have just one thing for you. Uh, a formal warning. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell Blacklist. This is probably one of the biggest multi-platform gets we've gotten all year. And it doesn't include co-op. Is it just a tradition at this point for every Wii U port to be missing something? I'd almost be more disappointed if it wasn't. I mean, cool. This is one of those games where it's just not gonna make a difference if it's there or not. Tom Clancy games do well, but Tell me, did you know this was on Wii U? And even if you did, did you care? Nintendo held yet another Direct this month, which mostly shared info on games we already knew about coming in the second half of the year. Though we got a handful of releases detailed that were exclusive to the Nintendo eShop. Yeah, this thing wasn't firing at all cylinders quite yet. And Nintendo was keeping to a fairly consistent release schedule for Virtual Console, but I already explained why that wasn't exciting. Oh yeah, it's Galaga week! What really got you to log back into the eShop were the original releases. Up to this point though, Nintendo themselves mostly put out applications like Wii U Panorama View, which was POV, you're a bird. Wii Street U, which was POV, you're Google Maps. These were cute little distractions that utilized the gyroscope of the gamepad, but Nothing more. We needed games, not toys. Every now and then throughout the year, we would get something like a Toki Tori 2, a Cloudberry Kingdom, a DuckTales Remastered. But for the most part, we used struggle to get even the small downloadable titles Xbox 360 and PS3 got. So Nintendo had to pick up the slack. In August, we got three eShop exclusives from them. Art Academy Sketchpad, a basic drawing application released prior to a full-fledged Art Academy to give me versed artists something to live for. Pokemon Rumble Rumble U, the first Pokemon game on the platform, and the first bad one at that, and Animal Crossing Plaza, a free download giving Wii U owners a Wara Wara Plaza themed entirely around Animal Crossing. Now, that seems really cool. It's like you can download themes for your Wii U menu, but no, this is its own app you have to voluntarily open to look around in and then leave. It would have been great to choose a themed plaza for your Wii U to boot up with. You could have had ones based on all the Nintendo series, but no, they just did this one to coincide with Animal Crossing New Leaf's release a few months back, giving New Leaf players a hub where they can see what everybody else is saying on a platform that doesn't have New Leaf. It was free, I, I can't really complain. This is probably just an excuse for the Animal Crossing team to mess around with HD development, but still, this app's entire existence always perplexed me. It was only available for a certain in time. Why? What was happening on this date? Oh, it's offline. But oh, how I wish Pokemon Rumble U had that expiration date instead. What a worthless game that was somehow worth $18. But hey, if you wanted to spend more on it, they finally made use of the NFC capabilities of the gamepad. For $4 a pop, you could pick up these little figures you can then scan into the game. It's pretty pointless, it's weird just if you want to buy some toys and see them appear on screen, but hey, it's good to finally use plastic and the lower left hand side of the gamepad. And my hand, it's just good to be alive. But you know who must really feel good to be alive? People who didn't buy a Wii U. Yeah, after months of saying a price drop wasn't happening, Nintendo folded on August 28th, 2013. They announced the deluxe set would start retailing for $299.99, a $50 price cut, starting on September 20th. 
Uh, why they announced this a month beforehand is beyond me, considering I think they solidified not selling a single Wii U for three weeks. This was a good move, though. I, I don't think they took it far enough. The deluxe set now costs the same as the basic set, but that set didn't get a price drop. In fact, it was basically silently discontinued here. If they kept the basic set around and dropped its price to $250, I feel like that would have been a bit more effective because technically, the Wii already started at $299, so dropping the deluxe set's price to that uh, wasn't all too eye-catching. Though Nintendo was already selling the Wii U at a loss before all this, so I'm sure they would have dropped the basic set's price if they responsibly could have. But hey, every little bit counts. The price drop does help things. Though, early adopters of the Wii U didn't get anything out of this. Now, why would they? Well, Nintendo did a similar thing with the 3DS. They dropped the price by $80 four months in, and as a thank you to those who bought the system at the original price, they got a slew of free virtual console games. Wii U owners didn't get anything for their initial loyalty. Uh, to be fair, they didn't owe us anything. You know the risk buying a console within the first year. You're gonna pay more to have less to play than somebody buying it years down the line. And the 3DS got a way bigger price cut way sooner. So I understand why they had to reward early adopters there and not necessarily on Wii U. But at the same time, I do question why they didn't at least give us something. In addition to the price cut, they announced a Wind Waker HD Special Edition console to also be released on September 20th, as well as finalizing some upcoming game release dates. Uh, we were officially heading into a make it or break it holiday season for Wii U. With next gen launching in November, Nintendo knew they had to pull it together. And did they do it? Well, before I answer that, let me respond to a phone call from somebody asking me if Nintendo didn't do it. Yes. Leading up to September, Nintendo held one more Nintendo Direct, this one dedicated to the wonderful 101, releasing alongside a demo for the game. And normally, this is a good thing, especially for a new IP. In Wonderful 101's case, the demo was on there. Let me be clear, this is not a bad game. This was just a horrible demo. A Wonderful 101 was already kind of hard to tell what it was, and this did not explain the controls well at all. Uh, taking a game that already wasn't gonna do well and probably scaring away a percentage of those who were gonna pick it up. Regardless, the wonderful 101 released on September 15th, the same week as Grand Theft Auto V. Not only was Nintendo confident in this title, they were fucking dumb. Yeah, this game bombed. I remember they slashed the price permanently to $30 just a few months in. That's when I picked my copy up. That's right, here is my save file from 2013. Uh, yep, two minutes in. Since then, I have tried this game a few more times, and I've always been kind of mixed on it. It's a great game. I have fun with it. When everything is working out, it's amazing. But there's always this menacing level of clunk looming over. You play as a large group of superheroes all at once and can build up your swarm over time, recruiting more throughout the stage while fighting enemies by swapping to new abilities by drawing on the touchscreen. It's a very hard game to describe. Basically, it's a big bombastic hack and slash with elements from Pikmin, Beautiful Joe, and Bayonetta. You come in your group by making certain shapes like Unite Sword, that's just the line, Unite Hand is a circle, etc. That's all fine, but this mechanic has always been so bitchy with me. I've just never gotten it to work consistently. You can use the right analog stick to draw, which helps to not have to move your hand, but isn't nearly as easy to form your shapes. But this combined with how fast and intense the gameplay is, feels like an odd pairing. Like this mechanic would work 10 times better in a slower paced game. There's always so many enemies on screen, with one being ginormous, and I end up wasting time fiddling around trying to get the ability I want, and then boom, I get hit, and all my heroes scatter around the place, and I have to pick them all back up every single time. It can just get kinda aggravating, honestly. It's pretty damn difficult, and sometimes a bit confusing as to what you need to do or where you need to go. The tutorial could have been a lot better here, but the issues I have with this game I always end up overcoming. It takes a while to get used to, but I think Wonderful 101 is worth sticking with. At the time, this was easily one of the best action games, and mostly because it's 95% action all the time. Not a ton of filler here, but when it is here, it's actually kind of cute. When you go inside a building, the gameplay transitions down to the gamepad, which sounds annoying, but it's oddly charming. This game can be frustrating. It can be confusing. It isn't for everybody, but that's what makes it special. It's a Platinum Games title through and through. 
incredible action throughout the entire adventure. This is the kind of stuff final boss fights are made of. Well, Wonderful 101, that's just the game. Stylistic, creative, unique, all help describe this game. While I wouldn't say it's accessible, I think it deserves a shot from any action game fan, and it gave the Wii U another ace up its sleeve. A game nobody gave a sh** about. Aw, oh, look at that lineup. I think more people are interested in Rayman Legends launching a few weeks prior, uh, not just on Wii U, but on 360, PS3, PC, and PlayStation Vita. Uh, thank God you delayed it so it wouldn't launch on a failed console. Well, we finally got it, and right when there was actual stuff to play, so a lot of people skipped out on this one. But Rayman's the type of game that's always relevant. It's timeless gameplay and graphical style, you can pick it up whenever and it'll be just as good as it was when it launched, which is why Ubisoft reported that while sales were underwhelming at first, they picked up after a while, though initially the Wii U version was the best-selling one. Yeah, take that Ubisoft, you thought you had anything to worry about. Truth be told, back in the day, I first played and beat Rayman Legends on PlayStation 4. However, I'd be a fool not to try the Wii U version the way this game was always meant to be played. Out of sympathy. Rayman Legends is one of the great 2D platformers of the 21st century. This is the game dreams are made of. One that doesn't look like a game. The animation, visual style, music, level designs all come together to create something that's a spectacle. Something that oozes passion and expertise. The people who made this game wanted it to be one of the best games of all time. And they knew how to do it. Every single stage has so much oomph to it. Whether it's one of the musical stages where every platform and enemy is placed to the beat of a song, or one of the insane boss fights, or even one of the many levels returning from Rayman Origins, this game is packed with nothing but quality. So, as a game, Rayman Legends is about as good as it gets. But how does it fare as a Wii U game? To be honest, the gamepad use here is a lot less involved than it initially seemed. For the most part, it's relegated to these stages where you control Murphy and can affect the environment by using the touchscreen, which is best played in a cooperative setting in multiplayer, though you can still use him by yourself in single player. It's a cool use of the controller, way better than Mario U in this regard. The gamepad user has enough to do to the point where they're basically playing a puzzle game down here that helps the other players proceed. It's really cool, though, I'd be lying if I said these stages were always a must to play. Murphy just kind of slows things down, both in single player and multiplayer, in what's usually a game that feels its best when you're running at full speed, going crazy. These levels, oftentimes I'd rather skip. In the other console versions, Murphy is controlled with simple button presses, which does help this issue, but at the same time, not controlling him via a touchscreen just makes us all feel pointless and weird. Like, why am I even doing this? So on 360, the levels are easier to jump in and blast through, while on Wii U, they actually feel like they have a point to them, so pick your poison. In the end though, Rayman Legends is awesome. Yeah, it really stunk to get that delay, but I'd say it was worth the wait. They included Mario and Luigi costumes because of it. I'll buy anything with that. Another big hitter in September was Scribblenauts Unmasked. This one's pretty simple. It's Scribblenauts with the focus being on DC superhero content. And not much more to say other than this sentence can repeat endlessly. It was all about that price cut and Wind Waker bundle though. September 20th hit and this beauty did as well. The third official version of Wii U. See, they did a few bundles, but they always had either a black or white console and gamepad in them. But this one's different. While the console is the same, the gamepad has Zelda insignia printed on it in gold, marrying a similar special edition 3DS they released a few years ago. This bundle contains a digital copy of Hyrule History Historia, a Zelda art book famous for revealing the official series timeline, now readable on your gamepad. Finally, it's just a basic ebook application. The real star of the show here is the inclusion of a download code for Wind Waker HD, releasing a few weeks earlier than it was meant to. See, Nintendo tried a new tactic with this one. The digital version launched in September, while the boxed copy made its way to stores on October 4th. Definitely a smart way to ease your customer base into being more comfortable buying retail games digitally. The only way you can play this 10 year old game right now. The Legend of Zelda, The Wind Waker HD. You know, what an amazing idea this was. Fill out the Wii U's release schedule with an HD remaster of one of the most 
timeless games. The original Wind Waker on GameCube may have been lambasted in its time due to its cartoony art style, but who's laughing now? This game looks amazing, even today. It's so amazing, I'm not even sure if an HD remaster was that necessary, but I'm not complaining, so I'll start. Wind Waker HD is stunning. They gave an already beautiful art style a fresh coat of paint with new lighting, widescreen, 1080p resolution. It looks truly remarkable. Though after seeing this version, it's easy to forget how good the original's visuals were. And in some cases, I think it's a little superior. Wind Waker HD's lighting is very exaggerated, emphasizing bloom and realistic shadows, which helps emphasize the bright tropical setting, but is quite different from the original's very deliberate style. The shading and color choice was reminiscent of a hand-drawn cartoon compared to the more gradient-focused look of HD. Uh, this isn't a bad thing. I think the Wii U game can oftentimes look better than the GameCube version, though the original looks consistently amazing, while in HD, uh, the lighting can make some scenes look off. Sometimes it's more striking, other times it's far less. I think in the end, I love the way both of these games look in different ways. While Wind Waker looks great all the time, the highs of Wind Waker HD's graphics are so damn high, while the lows, they're not bad, they just look a little weird. But that shouldn't take away from how visually striking HD is overall. This is an already great title that's infinitely enhanced by the graphics. It's just so fun to look at, you want to take in every location at every angle possible. Wind Waker may not have needed a remaster due to how well it held up, but it's obvious why it got one. They took something that already looked amazing and made it look amazing all over again in a whole new way. But that's not it when it comes to changes. They fixed a handful of glaring issues from the original. Uh, the Triforce quest near the end of the game has been abridged. The boat speed can be upgraded with the new swift sail item. Plus, you can now use motion control for aiming and the gamepad's touchscreen for inventory management, which is one of the best upgrades. Uh, the interface is so user-friendly. It's much easier to quickly assign items to buttons this way. Uh, it's a seemingly basic use of the second screen, but it's so effective. Uh, this may sound boring, but Wind Waker HD has some of the best gamepad use. And it's not even required. You can use a pro controller and play the game normally. This is a superb upgrade and allows Wind Waker to shine like never before. At this time in gaming, most HD remasters and remakes, you could tell they were old games. While with Wind Waker HD, that's not the case. And this doesn't feel like something to help fill the gap in the Wii U release schedule. This just flat out feels like a Wii U game. And when that Wii U game is Wind Waker, one of the greatest adventure games of all time, with some of its biggest initial flaws ironed out, you have not only one of the best Wii U games, but flat out one of the best games of all time. The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker HD is miraculous. I fell in love with it after picking it up at retail later that holiday, and you can tell Nintendo knew how special this was. The gold, shimmering box art released alongside a limited edition exclusive to GameStop. This was only $10 more and you get a whole ass Ganondorf figurine, let alone the game by itself was only 50 bucks. This was truly the era of Nintendo's not doing well and passing the savings on to you. I gotta stop buying their stuff. And nowhere was that more evident than the Wii Fit U Direct in September. Uh, yeah, they were giving these things to anybody. Yeah, after a full year, out two years since it was teased, Wii Fit U still isn't out. But this direct aimed to give some concrete information, most notably the price. Starting in November and ending in January, Wii Fit U would be available for free. You can download and play to your heart's extent for a full month, and if you want to keep going, you would have to buy a fit meter in stores for 20 bones. Well, damn. I think Nintendo knew the current user base on Wii U wasn't about to buy the Wii Fit U balance board bundle for 90 bucks. I think this was a smart tactic to just get people to try it. But that wasn't really the big news in this direct. Nintendo announced an HD remake of Wii Sports. That'll solve Everything. I remember reading that headline on my phone on the bus to high school and getting so excited. Wii Sports in HD with online play? It was everything I thought I ever wanted. My pen ran out of ink. However, the more I think about this, the more it feels like a desperation move. Wii Sports Club was the name, and they only had two sports ready for launch in November, with the rest of them coming at a later date, each being sold separately under a payment method that was supposed to replicate a country club. 
or I can just play Wii Sports. And hey, if we do that after a Wii U system update in late September, we can play it alongside all other Wii games on the gamepad. Oh my god, this changes everything! This adds so much value! It practically turns this into a portable Wii! This is amazing! Oh, well, why would I possibly want to do that? Off TV play for Wii mode is a bit misleading. Uh, you pretty much use the gamepad as a small display to play your Wii games on. Uh, you still have to use the original controllers, though. The camera on here doubles as a sensor bar, which is pretty neat. It's not a useless feature at all, but it does show how duct taped together this operating system is in the background. The gamepad features all the same buttons as a Wii Classic controller. Th why can't I use this in Mario Kart Wii or Smash Brothers Brawl or to scroll through the Wii menu is beyond me? But this led into a Nintendo Direct the following day first day of October, kicking things off with a new trailer for Super Mario 3D World. And unlike the first one to D3, this one actually elicited an emotion out of me. Gone was the sterile, bland style, and in came some actual damn personality. They're showcasing new power-ups, items, cutscenes, level themes, boss fights, all cut together to live big band music. This genuinely changed everybody's perception of Mario 3D World going from this year's Mario game to a must buy. I was getting pretty optimistic about Wii U at this time. I mean, the game lineup was really shaping up. You had a 3D Mario, tons of other games this holiday season, and a price cut to the mix, and it felt like things could actually turn around. Hey Scott, it's you from the future. I have bad news. You have eczema. Well, you know what they say. We Party U released in October of 2013. Oh man, just what the Wii U needed. A multiplayer party game focused on using the gamepad. Next, I hope we get a multi-platform game missing features. Oh, and you say Nintendo doesn't listen to fans. This is actually one of those fabled no-brainer games to pick up as it cost $49.99 and came bundled with a Wii remote, essentially making Wii Party U $10. I don't know whether that's really cool or incredibly concerning. Nintendo's pulled this trick before with games like Wii Play and Fling Smash, and oftentimes these games aren't worth any more than $20 by themselves. It's still a good deal, but barely. However, Wii Party U doesn't feel like it was designed around this bundle. Uh, this is a full game through and through, one I wouldn't think twice about being $50 without a Wii Remote. This is an amazing deal, no doubt. I mean, why wouldn't you buy Wii Party U? Oh yeah! It's Wii Party U. This is a cute game that you can have some fun with, but it just does not have much lasting appeal. Which is strange considering how much stuff is here. I mean, it's bursting at the seams with modes and mini games. It's like this is the only game you'll ever need. In hell, there's just nothing to these modes after one or two playthroughs. Uh, they oftentimes last 10 minutes, are fun, but then you play them again, and the magic is gone that second time. You then move on to the next mode, and it's the same exact story, rinse and repeat. The gamepad use here can be cute and interesting, but also a bit forced, with games oftentimes putting utilizing the controller over being fun. But Wii Party U's big idea with this thing was the tabletop game. Two players use the gamepad on a coffee table to play these little guys, but of course, with how the gamepad is designed, if you set it down, you cannot set a drink on it. It's a little slanted, which is why Wii Party U comes bundled with the gamepad horizontal stand. Wii Party U is okay. It's nothing to write home about, but I'm already here anyways. You buy this for the Wii Remote bundle. That's a huge bonus in this game's favor. But even on its own, it's definitely serviceable. Just don't expect it to last you a while. Eh, not today. Now I think a game that was definitely more intriguing this month was one of our few third-party exclusives. Sonic Lost World finally released during what I consider to be a comeback era for the franchise. Sonic Colors, Generations, the All-Stars Racing spin-offs, oh, Sonic 4 at the time I thought it was pretty good. So to get a new Sonic game felt really exciting. Uh, like they knew how to make modern Sonic work now. We no longer had to question if this game stinks. Lost World polarized critics. The scores were genuinely all over the place, ranging from one out of tens to nines. I remember seeing numerous fans defend this game to hell and back, uh, seeing websites like IGN and GameSpot giving it a five, uh, claiming that they don't know how to play Sonic Lost World. They give Call of Duty and Mario perfect scores for trying new things to end up lambasting Sonic for doing the same? Yeah, what the hell? You give Super Mario Galaxy a 10 out of 10, but in comes F Sponge Jerry and you don't care why? I think we were all a little on edge wanting the Wii U to succeed 
take a game like Sonic Lost World, we were praying would help things out, and it just made things awkward. Well, what do I think of Lost World? I don't hate it. This is a game with some weird design choices. It feels like a bunch of concepts just thrown together. The variety is the spice of life, but this just feels like a ransom note. One level's a cylinder with different pathways all around it. The next is this wide open field with not a ton going on. The next is an auto runner. The next is fully 2D. Which that, in addition to the basic level themes, really make this sound like Super Mario Galaxy. But that game has a core base everything is built off of, whereas Sonic Lost World feels a lot more like random bullshit. And I don't think the controls help in this matter. The Sonic's ability to run up walls and do parkour has potential, but is wasted with finicky controls that don't work when you want them to, but do work during the worst possible moments. Plus, the level design just doesn't take advantage of this. It feels like a marketing gimmick, something to show Sonic running up walls just because it looks cool. Many elements like using parkour effectively and this new kick mechanic aren't explained very well, partially due to all tutorials being relegated to the gamepad. You have to run into these icons, the game is paused, you look down and dismiss the message with the touchscreen. Well, thank God they're using the gamepad. Lost World feels like a bunch of random levels clumsily tied together with an insultingly stupid story and no world building, which sounds dumb to complain about in a Sonic game, but when you have cutscenes after every stage, I just question the point if your response to what's going on here, where's this taking place, and who these new villains are is... Can you shrug my shoulders for me? I'm too lazy. Lost World is directionless, there's no getting around that. Though I can see glimpses of a coherent experience, there are moments where the controls and stage mesh together pretty well and you end up having fun with the game. Another mind-blowing, but an interesting interpretation of Sonic. While the formula present in Sonic Generations was an obvious winner, it had a lot of drawbacks. Sonic in 3D mostly felt like you were running down an alleyway. It was fun, but there's only so much you can do with this, both as a player and as a designer. Sonic Lost World stages are generally more open and allow for incredibly free 3D movement. It's definitely a slower Sonic game. I mean, you flat out have a run button now. But that allows for a game where you feel far more in control. Uh, that is, if the controls worked half the goddamn time. Sonic Lost World isn't bad, but it's weird, it's frustrating, it's annoying, but it's so colorful, it's smooth, it has a wonderful soundtrack, some cool ideas. It's a mixed bag. I don't hate this game, not by a long shot, but man, I also just don't give a shit about it. It's just kind of there. I don't see how this could be your favorite Sonic game or least favorite Sonic game. It's just the Sonic on Wii U. It could be worse. Yup. Pac-Man and the Ghostly Adventures also released that October, this being a multiplayer release, which, hey, that's a win for the Wii U. And then you realize this is based on a kid's show and thus falls into the licensed kids crack the Wii U library is most of the time. Now that doesn't make a game bad, it just makes me question why I'm playing it. Especially if it's bad. This game is bad. It's just a whole heap and pile of nothing, which is a bummer considering Pac-Man's had some solid 3D platformers before. But in 2013, the only way we were going to get one is if it was tied to a cartoon series, lined up perfectly with marketing, and was the most generic interpretation of a Pac-Man 3D platformer of all time. Damn, Scott, if you don't like mediocre Pac-Man 3D platformers, then what do you like? Well, how about what else released around this time on Wii U? Just Dance 2014? No. Just Dance Kids 2014? Nah, uh, Skylander Swap Force, uh, Wipeout Creating Crash, Angry Birds Star Wars, Lego Marvel Super Heroes, SpongeBob Plankton's Robotic Revenge? Oh my god. Yeah, this era in gaming was pretty rough for anything other than the AAA core M rated video game, of which, hey, we got three in October. First up, Batman Arkham Origins, launching day and day with the other consoles, which was definitely nice to see after one of Armored Edition's biggest complaints was how it was a year old game at that point. And apparently this version was to run the best until it didn't. The worst frame rate of all the consoles. The season pass for the game was canceled in January of 2014 due to a lack of interest. The multiplayer in general was cut. $10 cheaper. At that point, you may ask, what is the point? You know the Wii U version ain't gonna sell well. You don't include numerous features because of that, which basically confirms it's gonna sell worse than ain't gonna sell well. So why bother, both as the developer and the consumer? Well, at least with Deus Ex Human Revolution Director's Cut this month, we got what may be considered the definitive version of the 2011 title. This was originally announced as a Wii U exclusive, but was quickly changed to a multi-platform release. We couldn't even get an exclusive version of a multiplayer. At. Then it turned out the Wii U version would be $20 more expensive. 
Why? Why, because of the extra gamepad features, of course. Features that were also in the Xbox 360 and PS3 versions via mobile apps and the PlayStation Vita. So it's not like the Wii U features weren't in the other versions. If anything, that to incorporate those features in ways that less people would utilize them, because who the hell used a Vita with this game? Well, Human Revolution on Wii U does fully utilize the gamepad and uses it well, though it is one of those games that does not support the Pro Controller, which is just kinda silly. It's definitely one of the better Wii U ports, but $20 better? Your money would be better spent on Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag this month, son of a bitch. October 2013 was a strange month for Wii U games. On one hand, we got more support than ever before that year. On the other, these were all deeply flawed releases, ones that showcase more problems with the console than reasons to buy it. However, that was all about to change that very next month because we finally got that one must-have game. Uh, no, 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 no. Super Mario 3D World launched on November 22nd, 2013. The same day as not only A Link Between Worlds and Mario Party Island Tour on 3DS, but the Xbox One as well. Not to mention the PlayStation 4 released the week prior, so things were pretty hot and heavy in the gaming industry. But Mario 3D World pulled through. Just look at these reviews! Perfect scores across the board, hell, oh, barely anything below a 9. Nintendo did it. They pulled it together, gave it their all, and supplied the Wii U with one of the best games that holiday season. And with that, the console started to sell. People just had to have the latest and greatest Mario game, especially when the new consoles had such lackluster launch lineups. Oh, damn it, I forgot to start that sentence with what if. Super Mario 3D World is a phenomenal platformer. It genuinely has some of the best level designs, power-ups, music, and fun to be had out of not only all Mario games, but games in general. This is a masterclass in gaming. But who the hell cares? 3D World has always been an interesting game for me to discuss, considering how much its perception shifts. Uh, when it was announced, eh. When it released, holy shit. About a year later, eh. After that, holy shit. The overall truth about this game lies in the middle for me. I feel that upon its release, we definitely had a good bit of hope this game would turn the Wii U around, and coupled with the game's great quality and mainstream appeal, I think that explains all the amazing scores. Not that it didn't deserve them, rather, I feel they oversold how amazing this game really was. 3D World is great, though it's not really anything we haven't seen before. It, yes, it's four-player multiplayer in a 3D Mario. Yes, we have new power-ups, level themes, it's definitely really fresh as far as this era of Mario was going. But I don't think that set it apart all too much. For most people, this looked like any other Mario, and its main selling points were hard to convey. It has four-player multiplayer. Yeah, so does New Super Mario Brothers. Yeah, but, well, this is in 3D. So? 3D World wasn't concerned with being revolutionary. Uh, rather, it was just trying to be really, really good. And it succeeded at that. But it made the game feel pretty non-essential to play. I mean, pretty much every Mario game is really, really good, and this one looks just like 3D Land or New Super Mario Brothers, but in 3D now. So while yes, this game was fantastic, it wasn't really the killer app the Wii U needed. It was a must have if you already owned a Wii U, but to everybody else, this looked like nothing new. It barely used the Wii U gamepad outside of a few levels where it was shoehorned in, forcing touchscreen gimmicks for no reason. While it looked good, it was super polished and colorful, the art style doesn't leave the lasting impression a game like Mario Galaxy did. The gameplay of mixing 2D Mario with 3D Mario, while done incredibly well, just wasn't what the Wii U needed at the time. We needed a big game with huge detailed worlds, not sanitized obstacle courses in the sky. So hopefully that explains why this thing didn't really move units while still getting rave reviews. The Nintendo consoles are oftentimes defined by the big Mario game that releases on them. And for 3D World to be the Wii U's, I think withheld a special significant moment from the console while putting a lot of pressure on 3D World to be something it wasn't trying to be. Nobody won. This really needed to be a game that came out after a Super Mario Odyssey type experience. I mean, look at how that game excited everybody. It felt like Mario, but with so many new and innovative ideas delivering an experience you had to have right now. Whereas 3D World is a lot more laid back. It's a different style of 3D Mario, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's a place for this game, and I love it. But it makes more sense as another 3D Mario on a system, rather than the 
only 3D Mario on a system. With that being said, I love Super Mario 3D World. Each and every stage is expertly crafted. While they may use that non-organic, geometric, video gamey design, uh, they're all still incredibly fun to blast through, whether you're alone or with friends. The amount of power-ups is absurd and keeps things consistently exciting. The different playable characters, each with their own attributes, is an awesome addition. The soundtrack is incredible. The visuals are so damn squeaky clean and can genuinely be impressive at times, even if the art style is a bit bland. And the final world being a Bowser-themed amusement park, the final boss being this incredible journey up to a tower ambushed by shits in a box Bowser, the levels you unlock afterwards just keep you playing more and more, unlocking Rosalina as a playable character, powering through one of the hardest final levels in Mario history. Gah! This game was in the wrong place at the wrong time. I think it's genuinely fantastic. It just can't replace a big open 3D Mario adventure. But that's because Super Mario 3D World is its own kind of Mario game. One that deserves to be played by everybody. One that deserves recognition. And one that deserves better than being the Wii U's 3D Mario. This kept me busy for months. It may not have been what the Wii U needed, but it was definitely what Wii U owners needed. Though that wasn't the only Mario action on the platform we got in November. Yep, you know how things work logistically. If one thing happens in 2013, we're sure to get another. Mario and Sonic at the Sochi 2014 Olympic Winter Games, the second title in Nintendo and Sega's Sonic exclusivity deal. It was worth it. These games, they're fine at best. These are mini game collections disguised as 20 plus sports in one package but none of them have the depth and variety to warrant playing them more than two times, maybe. Don't get me wrong, most of the events here are decently fun, but after one play session with a Mario and Sonic game, man, I'm out. But this entry was gonna be different. It's in HD now, it has online play, and it's the worst one yet. Oh, okay. So this game is just, it's really lame. It's pretty much a less fun, overly complicated repeat of Olympic Winter Games on Wii. A handful of the events require you to play them with the Wii Remote Plus, set the controller down, swap to the gamepad, and then go right back to Wii Remote. It's genuinely upsetting. The promise of online play was exciting, but then you realize it's only available in four events. And then you realize none of the events in Mario and Sonic have enough depth to really want to play them online. The presentation's pretty damn good here though. Like these character models are so damn high quality. Uh, plus some of the dream events, which are wackier Mario and Sonic-esque takes on Olympic sports are pretty cool, uh, but is that reason enough to buy this game? Okay, well, what if they offered a bundle containing a blue Wii Remote Plus for $59.99, getting $10 more than the base game? They were just giving these things away. Or were they giving these away? Worthless release that did nothing for the Wii U library. You might be saying, damn, Scott, that's harsh, and hey, I could have said it's a genuine pile of that never deserved anything past getting its head kicked in. Nintendo and Sega should be ashamed of creating these characters in the first place if it led to this unholy fucking dick and sh sh and sh and sh But I decided not to. Just another reason to hate this game. It starts discussions. Well, if that's exactly what I don't want, then Wii Fit You was for me. I played Wii Fit You. Such a busy time of year to cram damn Wii Fit in. And not only for Wii U, but the games industry as a whole. Though to be fair, the unique release strategy Nintendo employed made it fairly easy to warrant trying this game out. But once again, it was a free download. As long as you already owned a balance board, you were set for a full month. Afterwards, if you wanted to continue playing, all you had to do was pick up a Wii Fit U meter for 20 bones. I'm not sure Nintendo made any money on this game. I mean, a workout routine is hard to stick with. I'm certain most people played this for a week or two and got their fill. Which is unfortunate because We Fit You is good? This is genuinely one of the most fun and in-depth fitness games I've ever played. There's a ton of activities here, many new and many from previous styles, and on top of everything else included, the attention to detail, the use of a pedometer, hell, I'd say this has some pretty creative uses of all the controllers. The gamepad is used 
cutely here. Not essential to the experience, but they found some fun and effective ways to utilize it. Hell, being able to work out off the TV with it in addition to the pedometer functionality breaks the Wii Fit experience free from the living room, so everything feels like it comes together in the end. A very natural evolution of the series. Uh, swapping between Wii Remote, Gamepad, two Wii Remotes, Wii Remote and Nunchuck, Balance Board, no Balance Board seems like it would be a headache like with other games, but this is a workout. It's like swapping equipment. I think it's fine here. It seems like a mess, but it's a fairly organized mess, all things considered. Man, it's just, this is what I think we all wanted Wii Fit and Wii Fit Plus to be. Those games nowadays feel pretty empty. There's not a lot to do, and what is there doesn't really make you break a sweat. Wii Fit U has so many options, and the games are a perfect balance of fun and exercise. I was really impressed by Wii Fit U. Still we fit you. This game could have been the perfect experience. Absolutely mind-blowing. Wouldn't have made a difference. Just because you're the best Wii Fit game doesn't mean you're anything more than just more Wii Fit. And for most people, this was a complete fad. By 2013, nobody really cared, which is why it was so satisfying for this to finally come out. Oh, thank Christ, we're moving on. I don't understand why this took so damn long to release. I mean, like, they technically revealed this in the debut trailer for the Wii U at E3 2011. Then it got re-unveiled the next year, and then a year and a half later, it's finally out. And I'm sorry, when most of this looks practically identical to what came before, I just have to ask how this took so long to launch? You can't even point to the new main game gimmick, the fit meter. And they didn't have anything to develop with this. It's like the third time they've used this pedometer design. I'm just confused. Maybe it's the fact this was the only Wii U game to support the balance board. I mean, that's a lot of pressure. Regardless, what we got was Nintendo's fitness game Magnum Opus. It obviously wasn't ever going to change things for the Wii U, but it's cool to see the Wii Fit series evolve into the best version of itself on this console. Oh my god, it's that statement's evil twin! Wii Sports Club also launched this month, barely, a free digital download where we could buy access to bowling and tennis with the others coming at later dates. You know, I was extremely excited about this, but I only really ever played this once or twice. The concept of Wii Sports with online multiplayer is awesome, but that's pretty much all this game has going for it. Wii Sports Club always had this pathetic aura around it. Like creating an HD remake of Wii Sports of all games is just kinda lame. Especially when you can already play the original on Wii U via backwards compatibility. When you have to pay $10 for each sport individually, when there's no substantial new content whatsoever, and when it only launches with two sports that don't even use the gamepad, and there was no word on when the other sports would release or what they even looked like. The savior of the Wii U, everybody! Let's remake the game everybody already has two copies of! This isn't a bad release, it's just a strange and confused one. Did Nintendo think this would woo casual consumers over, getting them to finally buy a Wii U? Because they thought this was just a Wii with a new controller, showing a game that looks just like Wii Sports wasn't gonna help things. And on top of that, you think Grandpa would understand this pricing structure? Well, first he needs to understand Wii U. Uh, after basic economics. It's something neat to mess around with, but I think Nintendo should have planned further ahead with this. Maybe a fully featured new Wii Sports title with sports designed around the gamepad, which could have also included the original 5 from Wii Sports remade in HD. I think it's just silly how Wii Fit U is basically that for Wii Fit. You have almost all the activities from past games included there, plus all new ones. Why couldn't Wii Sports get the same treatment? The big third party release this month was Call of Duty Ghosts, which got completely swept under the rug, which is unfortunate considering this is a fine version of the game, very similar in quality to Black Ops 2 on Wii U. But by this point, nobody cared. Call of Duty on Wii U, while competent, was more of a novelty of anything. Black Ops 2 had the benefit of being a launch title. Many people were willing to see what it played like on the new console. But by the time Ghosts released, I think most Wii U owners knew better than to invest in a game like this on the system. What, you're gonna pay full price for this and have access to none of the DLC, have worse performance, have low player counts in the multiplayer, all a week before the next generation consoles launch alongside the better versions of Call of Duty Ghosts? Fine, Activision, I won't buy your game, okay? The rest of November's lineup was chock full of licensed shovelware, which wraps up 2013's retail Wii U releases. Of course, the Nintendo eShop was updated throughout the rest of the year with smaller titles, indie games, and virtual console releases, but this was the Wii U's physical lineup that year. 49 games, 
12 more than last year. And keep in mind, last year was a month and a half long. Is that impressive or is 2013 even more pathetic than I thought? Well, this month also saw the launch of two Wii U bundles for the holiday, the Mario and Luigi Deluxe set featuring a combo disc of new Super Mario Brothers U and Luigi U, and the very last basic set released here in North America, the Skylanders Swap Force Bundle the same day as the PlayStation 4. Ah, yes, I suggest we use this white flag to attack the enemy. This was actually a great deal. It was $2.99, came with the full Swap Force set, which retailed for 75 bones by itself, which also had an exclusive gold figure included, a physical copy of Nintendo Land, plus extra goodies like a poster and stickers. Damn, Nintendo was really trying to grab the attention of kids everywhere with the Wii U. A case in point? <laughs> So let's take a look at Nintendo's advertising efforts with this system for 2013, all right? For the most part, TV commercials would only debut alongside big new titles in the holiday season. Game-specific ones normally follow the same format of the kids are in the game world. They're not egregious, they're just lazy. There was no thought put into these. They looked fine, but could you really imagine standing by the water cooler going, you won't believe the commercial I saw last night. Some kids were playing Mario and then their living room turned into Mario. It's genuinely the bare minimum they could have done to advertise these games to a general audience. Well, not the bare minimum. This stinks. I get Nintendo is trying to use the Wii U's issues to their advantage with these ads. I mean, in one of them, a kid straight up mimics how their parents think the Wii U is just another Wii. But so it's like, you knew this was an issue, so why was it an issue to begin with? And like, this ad right here. There are no jokes, yet everything is presented like it's one. The closest things to jokes are the sounds the son and father make. Pew, pow. This is what the ad ends on. That's the stinger. And this campaign kept with the tradition of all Wii U ads feeling like they're just desperately listing bullet points as to how the console is different and worthwhile. But some of their points are just, with Wii U and Super Mario 3D World, we can find secrets with the Wii U gamepad. This? That's supposed to convince people to buy your console? This one focused on Wii Sports Club. They're wearing football jerseys. Football's not in Wii Sports Club! And I have to reiterate, guys, advertising how your console can play an HD remake of Wii Sports does not help your case. This isn't just another Wii, it's a new console! proceeds to show it playing Wii Sports and nothing else. Then this one has two kids explaining to their friends how to convince their parents to buy a Wii U. Hi, buddy, popcorn, that's a thing. The f*** is wrong with you? This is a bad ad campaign. It's so desperate, but not desperate enough to try. The comedy here is non-existent. It's just replacing jokes with being cheesy as hell, and I'm not saying, oh, it has cheesy jokes and they stink. No, like, this was the only thing considered a joke here. Yeah, it looked like I've been upgraded. And I don't think that's a joke! It just feels so lazy. Like they didn't want to put any actual effort into this and just hope that parents would think the kids here were being cute, heightened by the cheese of the dialogue. This just reeked of Nintendo giving up. Like you could have advertised the actual third party support you had this year. Even if most of it was lacking some features found elsewhere, it's still something you can advertise. Hey, a Wii U is less expensive than that new PS4 and you can still get the latest Assassin's Creed, Call of Duty, Batman, but in addition, play all the Nintendo exclusives. But no, going full blown kids family game console with this, felt like a defense mechanism. Like Nintendo was beaten so badly, they retreated and just did what they knew how to do. What everybody tells them is the only thing they're good at. And it's just sad. This wasn't a confident Nintendo, this was a desperate one. Want more proof of that? Well, if you wanted to play Super Mario 3D World before launch, where did Nintendo want you to go? To hell. Every single piece of marketing Nintendo put out at this time was so damn pathetic, tone deaf, and condescending. Wii U is in stores now for just $299.99. Just look for the U on the box. Well, that's great to know, but before I buy it, I have a few more questions. Uh, what stores can I get it at? How do I get to those stores? 
What's a store? Well, we had a few more news stories going into the end of 2013, like how Nintendo Land received a 50% price cut, retailing for just $30 starting on November 1st, which coincided with the Mario & Luigi Deluxe set. From here on out, the go-to Wii U Deluxe set on store shelves would change every year. Sometimes Nintendo Land would be included still, but it was sidelined for the headliner game of each bundle. But more often than not, this wasn't a pack-in anymore. They still tried to push it in other ways, with a Luigi Wii Remote Plus bundle releasing for 60 bucks a month later. But I think it's fair to say by this point, Nintendo had accepted that this game just didn't do its job. Oh, so that's why the Wii U isn't doing well. New Super Luigi U isn't the pack-in. November's Nintendo Direct focused almost entirely on Nintendo 3DS games, but not without a bit of Wii U news, like one final trailer for Super Mario 3D World, spoiling literally every secret about the game. There was a definite energy in the room that 3D World would save the Wii U, uh, so I'm sure Nintendo did this to get as many people on board before launch as possible. In Motley Boss Blob, I've misjudged you! But a big update they detailed here was the introduction of Miiverse on 3DS and the combination of both systems' eShop wallets. That's it, that's what's combining, nothing else. Are you happy? Dumb question, I'm sorry, let me try that again. When's the wedding? A big point of irritation for Nintendo fans in this era was how completely isolated the Wii U and Nintendo 3DS eShops were from one another. All while many of the exact same Virtual Console games would release on both as separate purchases. If you bought Super Mario Bros. on Wii U, that doesn't mean a damn thing for your 3DS. Buy it again! All while you could look up 3DS software on the Wii U eShop for some reason and couldn't do anything other than look them up. Sony was practicing cross-buy at the time, meaning if a game's on both PlayStation 4 and PlayStation Vita, if you buy it one place, you got it on the other free of charge. And just the fact they were both called Nintendo eShop, why are they two totally separated experiences? This made it harder to invest in the Nintendo ecosystem because there were two different ecosystems. Well, Nintendo threw us a bone here by making it so then if you had funds on one system, you could use those on either or. You could buy one game on Wii U and use the rest of it to score something on 3DS. You gotta admit, that's damn convenient. It's almost like you're using actual money. This was a band-aid on a corpse. It barely solved any of the issues here. Honestly, Miiverse on 3DS meant more for the Wii U in the long run. You could browse and post in 3DS communities on Wii U and vice versa. Uh, it was cool to have more to discuss with more people. While the year was winding down, Nintendo sure wasn't, because for weeks they were teasing an appearance at the Spike Video Game Awards to reveal, in quotes, something special. Oh my god, it must be more mature. I mean, why else debut it on Spike? They were the TV channel all about the boys, beer, maybe even a boob or two. But as the show approached, it was becoming more and more apparent Nintendo realized what they had wasn't making any headlines and tried to temper expectations. But you know how us Nintendo fans can be. Okay, so it's probably not something big like the next Zelda game reveal, but maybe the resurrection of Christ? This'll do. The big reveal was Cranky Kong being the fourth playable character in Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze at the award show where Grand Theft Auto V won Game of the Year. Priorities! God, this game just couldn't catch a break. It felt like every time Nintendo talked about it, the aura of disappointment surrounded everything. Now, especially here, considering this already lame-ass announcement was leaked a week prior. But hey, I mean, it was on us for assuming Nintendo would have some big reveals ready in December of 2013. And yet you hyped up the damn monkey. Yeah, a Nintendo Direct one week before Christmas. Uh, this was a welcome surprise, unlike the surprise some fans got at the beginning of this presentation. Not only do I love The Legend of Zelda, I love the fact that it has never crossed over with the Dynasty Warriors franchise. This Nintendo Direct opened with a brand new Wii U game reveal, being described as a collaborative title combining the action of Tecmo Koya's Warrior series with the world of Zelda. Most fans found this to be an unexpected yet pretty cool announcement. Uh, the trailer showcased Link in Hyrule Field mowing down enemies, which is all you could expect from a game titled Surely will come up with a better title than Hyrule Warriors. Though I recall many critics finding this reveal to be concerning as Zelda had this untainted legacy while Dynasty Warriors 
was just a taint. While these games had their fans, they never really captured the attention of the West. The gameplay was often seen as repetitive and mindless, the presentation was plagued by awful voice acting and performance issues, and you're telling me this gets the honor of the Zelda license? How could that happen? For some reason, many were treating this as if Nintendo announced it as flat out the next Legend of Zelda, even though the very first thing Iwata said after the trailer debuted was, this is not the next Legend of Zelda. It was always positioned as a spin-off, a cool side thing. And while I understood the concerns, they felt pretty shallow at the end of the day. I remember listening to podcasts from the big video game sites at the time, and the discussion I heard surrounding this game pretty much revolved around Dynasty Warriors being a bad franchise. And yeah, Warriors games aren't for everybody, and a handful get pretty mediocre reviews, but like, IGN gave Dynasty Warriors 8 an 8.7 out of 10 that year. Where was this all coming from? Regardless, I found the announcement of Hyrule Warriors to be pretty cool at the time. I mean, it was cool by default for being one of the first brand new Zelda experiences in HD, but the concept itself definitely had potential, and judging by all the Warriors crossovers we got after this, it just goes to show how brilliant of an idea this was in hindsight. Zelda fans got a cool hack and slash celebration of the series, the Wii U gets more variety in its line, up and Nintendo barely has to do a damn thing, which gave them ample time to release golf for Wii Sports Club. And this was shown off and released during the Nintendo Direct and actually acted upon that initial demonstration from the E3 2011 trailer. The visual of this was far more enticing than how it was in practice. It worked, but who the hell cares? This is just unnecessary. It's a clever use of the gamepad, I'll give it that, but this doesn't make a single damn difference. It's just, now I can see the golf ball on the ground. They threw in grass as well! <laughs> Nintendo! But that wasn't it for games releasing on Wii U that very day, because we also got NES Remix. Yeah, seems like Nintendo was making up for the lack of original eShop games throughout the year all at once, but I wasn't complaining because this was one of the coolest little things they did in 2013. Repurposing ass old NES games to create bite sized challenges out of them was insanely addictive. Plus, it gave just a single damn reason to play NES baseball again. But the remix challenges were the star of the show. You never knew what you were gonna get next. This was the perfect little downloadable game to play over the Christmas break. Though it wasn't alone, as another title was announced, coming just two weeks later on New Year's Eve. That being Dr. Luigi. New year, new me. Dr. Luigi is literally just Dr. Mario Online RX from WiiWare in HD five years later for $5 more. It's good, but there's really nothing to this one. It's just Dr. Mario again, but now with Luigi and a new mode featuring L-shaped pills, which aren't interesting. They just make the game significantly easier. But to be fair, all this game needed to be was Dr. Mario on Wii U. It was nice to have this kind of game accessible via the gamepad since it was perfect for quick bursts. And it reaffirmed Nintendo's commitment to their digital storefront. I mean, hell, many of their bundles for the holiday season just contained a download code for a game. So of course Nintendo was trying to get us to use the eShop more. I am too! Yeah, the Nintendo eShop was down for nearly a week, starting on Christmas of all days. Perfect end to the year when you were desperately trying to get people to buy your games that when they finally tried to. The Direct then ended with new trailers for Super Smash Bros. and Mario Kart 8, which gave Wii U fans a reason to be optimistic. We not only got big new game announcements, but meaningful looks at games we already knew about, plus great smaller digital titles to tide us over into the next year. And this all made for a great end to a fairly mixed year for Wii U. Uh, now, for Nintendo themselves, 2013 was one of their best. I mean, 3DS support was incredible! And you had the best of Wii U to that lineup, and <laughs> it was a real fun time to own both of these systems. But if we just focus on Wii U, what the hell were we doing the first half of the year? 2013 was pretty much carried entirely by Mario 3D World, and to a lesser extent, Wind Waker HD and Pikmin 3. The other titles were either too niche or weren't all too great or were multi-platform games that had huge caveats on the platform. It wasn't like there was nothing to play, but goddamn did it feel like it most of the time. I didn't want to play the exact same virtual console games I played on Wii again. I didn't want to play half-assed multiplats. 
I wanted Nintendo games, and they barely met the quota to satisfy me this year. But thankfully, 2014 was shaping up to house the big boy games of any Nintendo platform. It was the Mario Kart and Smash Brothers year, on top of other titles promised like Bayonetta 2, Hyrule Warriors, and keep this thing away from me, I've seen what it does to award shows. What's your New Year's resolution? I'll stick to DS games on Wii U. 2014 kicked off with Nintendo's investor briefing, detailing how the Wii U failed to do anything worthwhile and things were not looking good. The next slide I'm gonna show Brain Age. This was an odd thing to flaunt, especially considering nothing really came of this until April of 2015, but Sure, Nintendo DS games were coming to the Wii U eShop as virtual console titles, with the only example shown being Brain Age. I always envisioned a physical card reader you could plug into the USB port, giving you the ability to play DS and 3DS games on your TV, uh, just like what the Super Game Boy and Game Boy Player did for Game Boy games. But why do that when you can brag about this? We are now sure that we can solve the technical problem of displaying virtual console software from Nintendo DS on the gamepad. Why is this an achievement? I think everybody could already kind of picture the concept of playing DS games on Wii U. It's really not too difficult. I think it's harder not to picture it. I must admit though, this was a fairly compelling announcement as one, playing DS games on a TV wasn't something you could easily do. And two, this was actually taking advantage of the Wii U's capabilities. So damn, I can't complain. The week they announced this, they put out Mighty Bomb Jack on Wii U Virtual Console. Doesn't seem too bad now, does it? But as I said before, this meeting divulged on the Wii U's performance thus far, and Nintendo wasn't sugarcoating any of it. Sales projections were cut across the board. The holidays didn't make a substantial difference. The Wii U, in quote, was not in good shape. So what was Nintendo's plan to fix that? They just said it. This was the moment in which Satoru Wada famously took a 50% pay cut, an unprecedented move by a CEO. I mean, have you seen how most of them react to financial woes? They shoot the janitor for life insurance. Wada's plan moving forward seemed to be to double down on Wii U, while also giving up on it entirely. There was a lot of talk on making the gamepad more of a focus, actually utilizing the NFC reader and showcasing games designed around these ideas at E3 2014, while simultaneously introducing all these non-Wii U plans and solutions for their troubles. Most notably, a quality of life product focusing on health and wellness, which really highlighted how much uncertainty was felt surrounding Nintendo's traditional game business at the time. They talked licensing their IPs more to spread awareness and increase revenue, integration with smart devices, all solid ideas to help the company grow. But none of this involved Wii U. This wasn't something they had much hope in. This wasn't the future of Nintendo. This was a leech. This wasn't no ordinary struggling console. This wasn't like the PlayStation 3 where Sony slashed prices, rebranded, redesigned, made deals with third parties to bring games over or have exclusive content in them. They did that to save the PS3, but Nintendo just chalked up the failure to the lack of games that used the gamepad, and that's the only damn thing they did! What, was everything else perfect? Maybe. Doesn't help that in January 2014, the only major retail release since November was We Fit You, a game everybody already downloaded for free and then promptly forgot about before the free trial even ended. So thank God I can spend $90 on it now. What a waste of retail shelf space this was. Like, who the hell bought this? Who? Who? Yeah, we had to wait until February for a game worth a fraction of a damn, and, well, we got a fraction. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze. That'll help things. This fatal open wound is now a fatal wound. Listen, I don't blame Nintendo for thinking this was the right move. I mean, Donkey Kong Country Returns on Wii sold nearly 7 million units. You'd be stupid not to make a follow-up at literally any other time. Tropical Freeze was yet another 2D platformer, at a time in which that was practically all Nintendo was pumping out. Hell, even their 3D platformers felt like 2D ones. And after just getting Donkey Kong Country Returns 3D, after fans speculated like mad as to what Retro Studios was developing and it turned out to be That's Not Metroid 2, after getting delayed twice, and especially after the reveal of a geriatric chimp, this game? didn't feel worth it. I don't think many were in the mood for a new Donkey Kong, and this didn't really do much for the Wii U's lineup outside of increase it by one. Though, keep in mind, I'm not at all talking about the game's quality. Rather, how it was perceived at the time. People 
just didn't care. And that extended to game journalists as well. These two gave the game a six out of 10 and I give life a four. This thing was barely recognized as anything more than just another Donkey Kong game. And at the time, I sort of thought the same. I didn't pick this up until a few months later, and after playing through the game, I said, yeah, that was really good. Then I played it again later and thought it was really great. And by the fourth time, I think I was ready to legally change my last name. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze is one of the greatest platformers ever made just might take a second to grow on you though. I think many go into this expecting it to play like new Super Mario Brothers and are taken aback by how the characters feel and control, how the levels work, how difficult it can all be. Especially considering how in new Super Mario Brothers, I have the run button on lock and I'm blasting through these stages. Back in 2014 when I tried to do that in Tropical Freeze, and that is why I think many called this game unfair. Because it's not unfair, it's not too hard. You're just impatient. You're not actually absorbing any of the info on screen here. I refuse to believe that. The level design at play here is perfection. Challenging, but never unfair. It makes me so incredibly engaged throughout the whole thing. There's never a dull moment, and that's just how the stages are functionally. Visually, this is glorious. Unlike a Mario game, there's no floating platforms or what have you. Everything is designed to make sense in this world. If there's a platform, it's an organic part of the environment, like a tree branch or it's a rock being blasted up by lava. The world feels alive. It feels tangible, which makes the already sublime level design that much more compelling. There are a few nitpicks I have though. Uh, for one, you have three other characters you can partner up with throughout the adventure. Uh, Diddy Kong, Dixie Kong, and Cranky Kong, each giving you a unique added ability with Dixie Kongs being the obvious choice. You glide and get some height at the end of it. Uh, Diddy's is basically just a glide, so why would you choose him? And Cranky's cane bounce is way too situational to be all too worthwhile. I love the fact these characters are here, but Dixie pretty much makes them all pointless. The boss fights are great, though they can go on for far too long, and with no checkpoints, having to go through them all over again can just become monotonous. Much like the bonus rooms, which you can find in the levels, and they're all basically just variations of the same damn thing over and over again. Uh, the loading screens can be a bit long and oddly choppy, and for being the first game Nintendo released after making a clear statement on needing to use the gamepad more, they weren't lying. The damn screen just goes blank. You can do off TV play, but the TV is going dark too. Could at least put like a warning here that I don't know. But all these issues are incredibly minor and fail to take any of the respect I have for this game away. This is a marvelous video game. It may not be all too shocking or exciting because it is sorta of just another Donkey Kong game, but like it is so much better than that statement implies. Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze isn't revolutionary or groundbreaking, but that doesn't make it any less of a masterpiece. The Lego Movie video game also released this month. A Nintendo Direct occurred on February 13th, showing off Smash Brothers, a new Mario Kart 8 trailer with a confirmed release date of May 30th, more on Monolith Soft's X Project, and Bayonetta 2. I'm so, so excited, excited for Smash Brothers, Mario, Mario Kart, Kart X, and Bayonetta. Listen, a new Smash Brothers character is always exciting. Mario Kart 8 was looking better and better with each trailer, but like, goddamn, man. Being a Wii U owner meant you were going to hear about the same games nonstop, which is in stark contrast to nowadays where Nintendo will announce a game and really, uh, it's already out. So looking back at most directs from this era really highlights how much of the Wii U's life was just spent waiting, even for the smallest things. So they announced Game Boy Advance games were coming to Virtual Console before the DS games they just announced a year after they initially said Game Boy Advance games were coming to Virtual Console, but we had to wait until April for them. Why? Then NES Remix 2 was announced here as well, also releasing in April after the first one dropped day and date alongside its reveal, and I guess they did this because they truly had nothing until Mario Kart 8 launched, like for f**k's sake, they had preview events for this game. This was the big April release. Uh, we could launch it in March, but no, we're good. I honestly assumed more would happen in March, considering Nintendo announced the year of Luigi would end on March 18th. Oh my God, what are they gonna do? Nothing. Why did they give it an end date? The year of Luigi is over.
Return the Hostages. While 2014 was looking somewhat promising for Nintendo releases, the same couldn't be said for third parties, which is saying something considering how lackluster 2013's lineup was. The only major title we knew about this year was Cabela's. After speculation on a delay or even a cancellation, Ubisoft officially announced in February that Watch Dogs on Wii U would not be releasing alongside the other platforms in May, instead launching at a later unspecified date. Most people already weren't going to buy Watch Dogs on Wii U, and this ensured nobody was going to. Keep in mind, this was a heavily hyped game, uh, labeled as the first true next-gen experience, a game releasing on Xbox 360. But when it finally released, like, it was fine. Nothing all too groundbreaking or special, so you wait god knows how long and pay full price for a game nobody gave a shit about a week after release, but now with worse performance? It's a Wii U game, all right. Hey, at least we got an exclusive third-party game revealed this month. Remember that Sonic deal included three games? Well, here's the third! Sonic Boom! A new initiative for the franchise. They gave him a scarf, a TV show, comics, toys, and a video game exclusively for Wii U. That didn't look all too bad, honestly. This looked fairly high quality. I mean, the environments were detailed, the typical Sonic sections looked fast and fluid, now with a beat-em-up puzzle and exploration gameplay surrounding it. I gotta say, I was impressed. Oh man, well let's see where this impressed variant of Scott ended up. He didn't make it. Nothing happened in March. Volleyball for NES released on Virtual Console. and Hello Kitty Cruises is releasing next month. April's big release was NES Remix 2. It's NES Remix with different NES games. And I'm NES Remix with organs and skin. It's more so a new volume of the first one rather than a straight up successor, uh, though it does include some bonus games like the Nintendo World Championships Remix, which was a lot of fun to work my way up the leaderboards on. Uh, there was also Super Luigi Brothers, which you'd think would be in celebration of the year of Luigi, but remember, that shit ended in March. Seriously, why did it have that end date? Oh! The NES games included here are the ones you'd actually want to play, but the use of legitimately good NES games in the challenges ended up making this one feel a bit less worthwhile. Like, NES Remix made NES Baseball fun. It deserves a medal for that. NES Remix 2 has Mario 3. I kinda just want to play Mario 3. It's still a fun and addictive eShop game, but it is quite literally just more NES Remix. But hey, speaking of Super Mario Bros. 3, that finally launched on Wii U and 3DS Virtual Console this month. After being announced in August of 2013, they said it would come out that year. How the hell does this get delayed? Well, they had a packed schedule. They couldn't fit this in. I was so damn excited to get Mario 3 again, and then I remembered NES games looked and played like trash on Wii U. Oh. God, this, this just looks unpleasant. Uh, thankfully, this wasn't the case for all virtual console games. Like I said before, SNES games were solid, but joining that camp was Game Boy Advance. This was always a peculiar situation. Game Boy Advance games on Wii U. We never had Game Boy or Game Boy Color. Those were only on 3DS, which also got NES and eventually SNES plus Game Boy Advance games exclusively for those who bought the handheld within the first few months. I I, I don't fucking know. Listen, I'm not gonna complain about getting good legacy content on the Wii U eShop, especially legacy content we haven't seen be re-released time and time again like the NES and SNES games we've been getting. I'm just confused. Why this before Nintendo 64 or GameCube? Or hell, if you have no problem putting handheld games on Wii U Virtual Console, why start with GBA? Well, I feel that Nintendo did this because it was the easiest solution to ignite interest in the Wii U Virtual Console. And Nintendo 64 and GameCube emulation is trickier, and they were already re-releasing original Game Boy games on 3DS. Plus, they're original Game Boy games, so those wouldn't be very exciting. Yeah, Game Boy Advance games were put on 3DS, but only through what basically amounted to a limited time promotional offer. So, sure, that's one way to keep Wii U owner morale high. But hey, Game Boy Advance has quite the library, so while a bit strange as the third virtual console platform on Wii U, 
it was nothing but a good thing for the system. Multiple GBA games released in April and throughout 2014, all playing and looking spectacular. Feels very natural on the gamepad, and you can bring up the manuals on here as well, a screen smoothing option in addition to all the other features you'd expect from Wii U Virtual Console software. This is good stuff all around, and was how I played Mario & Luigi Superstar Saga, Metroid Zero Mission, Mario War Mega Micro Games, and honestly, I can't imagine much of a better way to experience them. Just nice to have the freedom to play on the gamepad like the original Game Boy Advance or on the big screen. This was great. But so what? Other titles released this month included The Amazing Spider-Man 2 and Lego The Hobbit, making for the best month of 2014 for the Wii U yet. Yup. But that was also because of all the news. Two Nintendo Directs, one themed around Super Smash Bros. and the other Mario Kart 8. Mario Kart got loads of previews this month. I remember waking up during spring break and seeing this new trailer in early April, then consuming loads of content by people in the games industry who got to play it early. All types of podcasts and preview videos and articles. It was that beautiful time in my life when I could do nothing but consume content surrounding Nintendo games when there was barely any content surrounding Nintendo games. Welcome to our 45 minute discussion on what this means for Wii U. The Mario Kart 8 Direct was uploaded a month prior to the game's launch on April 30th and was basically just made to announce the last few crumbs of info like baby Rosalina. Honestly, this felt more like a joke direct. Everything was tied together by a bunch of skits and the info revealed was pretty minuscule. A lot of this could have just been saved for players to discover on launch day. But I mean, this was Nintendo's biggest game of the year, so they pretty much had to try and hype it up as much as possible. A new Wii U bundle, a promotion where you could get a choice of free game download alongside Mario Kart around launch. They were making sure this game was gonna sell. Yeah, oh gosh, I'm so worried about this one. The Super Smash Bros. Direct was far more compelling as they had actual info to share here, such as the release timing. Super Smash Bros. for Nintendo 3DS would launch in the summer while Wii U would release in winter. I was oddly not expecting that. Firstly, Smash for 3DS, I always sort of forgot that was even happening. Like the Wii U version was the focal point of every piece of marketing. When a new character was revealed, they'd have a bunch of Wii U images and like two 3DS ones. The trailers barely showed footage of it and justifiably so considering these were practically the same games just with different stages and modes. So to hear that version was releasing not only first, but in the summer, it was surprising. But secondly, Smash Brothers for Wii U felt like it was the console's last chance at success. Everybody was excited for Smash Brothers. It was what kept Nintendo discussion alive throughout 2014. Waking up every morning, seeing the picture of the day on Miiverse, speculating on the newcomers, which veterans would make the cut. It was such a special time for virginity. And you were just gonna let the 3DS version capitalize on that first? There is that fear that Smash for 3DS launching first would ruin the opportunity for Wii U to succeed. For casual fans, why buy a Wii U for this game that's cheaper and available earlier on the more affordable handheld with a far larger library of titles? No. Doy. I always assumed these would launch at the same time, but looking back, this release method was the only one that made sense, alright? You put Wii U out first and it's fully featured as everything and anything you could have asked for, then put 3DS out later and it's just gonna feel like a gimped version of the Wii U game. Whereas the other way around, Smash 3DS releasing first, it already feels pretty fully featured, then the Wii U version will feel like a souped up take on the 3DS game. And if you release them both at the same time, you'd have fans picking one over the other. This way, there's a better chance people would pick up both, so this was the best way to go about things. Even if it created more doubts as to if Smash Brothers could save the Wii U. This Direct was far more technical than I was used to at the time, uh, featuring the game's director Masahiro Sakurai going into insane levels of detail regarding all the stages, items, fighters, and online multiplayer, which was a big concern going in after how iffy Brawl was. Nintendo solution? Buy the Wii LAN adapter. Welcome to the next generation of Nintendo. Lots of content to chew on here, especially with a new fighter reveal at the end, but this was just the beginning, as later in April, Nintendo's E3 2014 plans were revealed. 
A Super Smash Brothers Invitational? You can then play Smash Brothers at Best Buy? Live streams of new gameplay throughout E3? Nintendo Digital Event? Not a Direct? All announced in one of the greatest videos Nintendo's ever put on their YouTube channel? Which makes sense because Nintendo asked somebody else to make it for them. It was for the best. Have you ever seen a Nintendo trailer from this era? Who chose this font? Guilty. But would you believe that wasn't it for the month as in Japan, a new exclusive Fatal Frame game was announced for Wii U. God, there was actual stuff happening now. It was like this was a real life console. Which brings us to the Wii U at the height of its life. Of course, you know what happens afterwards. So let's cherish this. May 30th, 2014, Mario Kart 8 launched. And words can't describe how incredible this felt as a Wii U owner. Well, the word words can, but these can. Never before did a Mario Kart look this good, sound this good, play this good. Uh, prior entries didn't feel like they were developed with the knowledge that this was one of Nintendo's premier franchises. Uh, the presentation was always satisfactory, but with Mario Kart 8, I mean, over a decade later, and this is still one of the best looking and sounding Nintendo games of all time. The music is so rich and full with live instruments throughout. The characters are animated so fluidly. The tracks are so detailed. This was a marvel to experience in so many ways, including playing it because my God, this game was tight as hell. The controls were so perfect. The items felt well balanced. The online was legitimately pretty damn good. There was little to no debate. This was the definitive Mario Kart game when it comes to Dear God, anything but not racing. Yeah, so there's not much going on here outside of the core Mario Kart gameplay, which, yeah, I mean, that's to be expected, but it's not like this is packed with content, you know? It's just barely enough. 32 tracks, just like any other modern Mario Kart, barely more characters than Mario Kart Wii, nothing to really do other than play through the Grand Prix, do some time trials, and just grind online multiplayer, which, for the record, I had no problem doing. But this didn't really feel like it was doing much more than previous entries, especially when looking at the battle mode, which was obviously thrown together at the last minute. Instead of unique battle arenas like in previous games, they just have you duke it out on pre-existing racetracks, which are not designed for this type of gameplay, and it makes for an experience of the putrid variety. Also, remember how Nintendo said they wanted to utilize the gamepad more? It's a damn horn. There's other options you can select here, like off TV play and a map, but why is the default a horn? I remember the game was also criticized for its implementation of voice chat. You can only chat with friends, which, okay, fine, I get it. But only in the lobby. Once you enter the game, voice chat is disabled. Why? What, for better online performance? Well, I gotta say, if the online in your console takes that much of a dip transmitting the info you get from this micro penis of a microphone, you might as well just not even do online at that point. Why was there Wii U headsets? A big online feature here, though, was Mario Kart TV, where you can save and edit highlight reels of your races, and the camera work at play here always made these really worthwhile, leading to the most publicity Nintendo's received in years. The Viral Luigi Death Stare. Yeah, sure, roll with it. Even with some of its faults, Mario Kart 8 was an outstanding title. While its headliner gimmick, anti-gravity racing, didn't seem all too utilized, it allowed for some of the most creative and elaborate track design I've ever seen in a racing game. This has the best overall course selection of any Mario Kart in my opinion. It looks amazing, sounds amazing, plays amazing, it is amazing. The period surrounding Mario Kart 8's release felt like the Wii U actually stood a chance. Both the game and console itself were doing quite well. Uh, so how do you capitalize on that? You confuse Scott. Well, at least it was confirmed Mario Kart 8 would get DLC, and not in the form any of us were expecting, but it was DLC. Free DLC at that. If they charge for this, I'd be concerned for those who purchased. Oh, okay. Was this a product of Nintendo's desperation at the time? I don't know. I mean, it does feel strange to have Mercedes-Benz vehicles in Mario Kart, 
But I mean, they were advertising damn cigarettes in Mario Kart 64. You know what was also strange at the time? How limited the limited edition of Mario Kart 8 was. Yeah, I know. How dare a limited edition be limited? You can only get it at the Nintendo World Store. It was basically the same thing as the version released in Europe, which had a far higher quantity available. <laughs> nah, this one, they barely made any. You live in Ohio and want this version of Mario Kart 8 with a cheap blue shell statue? you go to France. Another investor briefing was held in May of 2014, detailing plans for a new Wii U system update in early June, which introduced the quick boot menu. Honestly, this just feels like the fifth band-aid on top of the operating system to try and make it faster. It doesn't really. It takes away a couple steps here, which is nice, but it still takes way too long to load up anything. It just feels like Nintendo tried to find and implement any solution possible to make the Wii U not slow as hell which was an impossibility. We also got our first look at Nintendo's NFC figurines at this briefing, co-named NFP, Nintendo Figurine Platform. The idea behind this was how the figures would work with multiple Wii U and eventually 3DS games, unlike other Toys to Life titles, which pretty much only did business within their respective franchises. This initiative killed so many birds with one stone, it would be considered a spree. Nintendo finally does Toys to Life, a booming genre and one that was well represented on Wii U already. Uh, they actually use the NFC reader on the gamepad, they do something that may actually spark interest in Wii U? which rumor had it at the time, there was going to be new hardware unveiled at E3 2014. Uh, whether that was a new console or new model of Wii U, I don't know. And that's because Nintendo know. That could have also helped spark interest in the system. I mean, slim redesigns of consoles like the PS3 and Xbox One did wonders for them. Though, Nintendo only really does those for their successful consoles. What are you trying to say here? Who knows, new hardware could have meant the figurines or, hell, something they announced later that May. In a promotional video detailing the Smash Brothers Invitational at E3 2014, the GameCube controller adapter for Wii U was revealed. The initial idea of playing Smash Brothers for Wii U without a GameCube controller was troubling for many. And sure, the Pro Controller was fine, and there was an announcement this month by PDP that they were making GameCube-like controllers that plugged into the Wii Remote to coincide with Smash. But this, this was the real deal. A wired USB adapter that supported the original controller, plus a new Smash Brothers themed one releasing alongside it. Uh, this was exciting for multiple reasons. Nintendo was actually embracing the competitive Smash scene as something they had never done up until this point, and the idea of GameCube compatibility with Wii U started to run rampant. Maybe I can play Mario Kart 8 with these controllers now, or maybe this means GameCube games will join Virtual Console. Maybe the Wii U will succeed, maybe world peace will be achieved, maybe you'll give a sh**. As a Wii U supporter in this time period, it finally felt like the console was a core focus for Nintendo and the game industry as a whole. That Mario Kart really rejuvenated things, plus with consistent news popping up and good news at that, for the first time, it finally felt like I wasn't doing something wrong owning this. And these positive feelings continued into June with E3 2014. Now, in terms of third party support, Wait a second, I found the footage! The only Nintendo games talked about at the show that Nintendo wasn't putting out was Sonic Boom, which looked far worse than the initial trailer did. The typical Skylanders, Disney Infinity, and Just Dance entries that year, uh, Watch Dogs, uh... Lego Batman 3. Yeah, there wasn't anything. Uh, there were murmurings that 2014's Call of Duty was hitting Wii U, that that never happened. Uh, Ubisoft did mention how they had a family-oriented Wii U game practically done, but were shelving it until it made sense to release. It never did. It was all up to Nintendo and Nintendo alone this E3 to prove the worth of Wii U. And did they do that? No, but to the fans they did. The E3 2014 Nintendo Digital Event was one of the best presentations Nintendo's ever done and completely validated the digital presentation format they pioneered. While the other companies' live press conferences dragged and had technical difficulties, Nintendo's digital event was a cool 47 minutes 
where no second felt wasted. Any moment that wasn't focused on a particular game was still just flat out entertaining. They commissioned the studio behind Robot Chicken to make sketches throughout, and it was so amazing to hear Nintendo be so self-aware, uh, cracking jokes on how fans and critics would beg for Mother 3 and Star Fox, complain about the overabundance of Mario games, the lack of a live press conference, even the criticism surrounding the Toon Link style of Zelda. Then, immediately, we get this epic, highly produced fight scene between Reggie and Iwata, announcing the Miis as playable fighters in Super Smash Bros. Then we get an overview from Sakurai, a trailer for Smash 3DS release dates, and the formal announcement of NFP, officially named Amiibo, all within the first 10 minutes. At last year's Nintendo Direct, I'm pretty sure there would be a full 10 seconds where Iwata was standing there saying nothing. The production value here, the self-aware comedy, the phenomenal pacing, the quality of the info shared, and the announcements being made, it was genuinely incredible. And as the presentation moved from game to game, it was so obvious how well they thought everything out. Some games just had basic trailers, while others had full-blown sections where the developers sat down to discuss them. But they didn't just have them talk out of their ass for 10 minutes, no. They had them talk about the titles we genuinely needed to hear discussion about. Hyrule Warriors, having the developers discuss that game really helped solidify it as so much more than just a cheap crossover. A Yarn Yoshi finally reappeared as Yoshi's Woolly World, that required a talking to, and Splatoon. Yeah, what the fuck is that? Explain. Captain Toad Treasure Tracker, Kirby and the Rainbow Curse, Bayonetta 2 comes with Nintendo costumes and Bayonetta 1 included? X is now officially Xenoblade Chronicles X, uh, Palutena from Kid Icarus and Smash Brothers, and that was all just the tip of the iceberg. Because this was where we first saw footage of The Legend of Zelda for Wii U. And this was me at that very moment. Oh. My. God, this exceeded any and all expectations. This looked unbelievable. An open world Zelda game that looked this good. The blades of grass, the incredible lighting, the enormous vista. There were hundreds of things going on in this shot while nothing was going on. And the action sequence afterwards gave you just enough to chew on before being left with the release window of 2015. Yeah, right! Regardless, this was a damn near perfect showing. I don't think you could have possibly shown anything better in that moment. Skyward Sword had its critics. The consensus was the traditional Zelda formula had run its course, so for this to be what was shown, I mean, this is what the Wii U needed. Pretty much everything we had gotten up to this point, while well, mostly good, was painfully derivative at times. But that wasn't the case for Zelda. <laughs> My god. 2015 couldn't come soon enough. And this was the first time in which one year lasted three. Mario Maker was this dream come true announcement. Like, come on, we've all thought of this one before. Making your own Mario levels. What a great use of the gamepad's touchscreen. And incorporating UI elements from Mario Paint made this all the sweeter. Hell, it originated as a new version of the game for Wii U. I will say, though, the status of it at this event felt very small downloadable title-esque. Uh, like, this was all you could do. Uh, make a Mario 1 level. You could switch to the new Super Mario Bros. U art style, but the physics were all still based on Mario 1, and it wasn't even that clear if you could share your levels online yet. But man, the potential of this one was through the roof. Just like Splatoon, the one of the first brand new Nintendo IPs in years that anybody gave a damn about. Contrary to popular belief, Nintendo is always churning out new franchises, but more often than not, uh, they're less so Mario and more so Math Fetus. But Splatoon just seemed to instantly have that spark. Uh, the way they were explaining the gameplay, how it correlated with the world and characters, a team-based shooter where you cover the most turf with your color of ink, but you're these squid-human hybrids. You can recharge your ink by swimming through it. It just, this was the most Nintendo way to do a multiplayer shooter. It looked so unique and was amazing to see Nintendo take a risk on a new idea for Wii U. Amiibo figures look cool solely based on the fact they were THE Smash Brothers versions of the characters. Uh, they were just like the trophies from the game! Th that's incredible! And Smash Brothers wasn't the only game compatible with them, all these other games were too! Now, what did these figures do in them? 
work! Yeah, I don't really think even Nintendo knew what Amiibo were gonna do in most of these games yet. Even the Smash Brothers support felt fairly superfluous. You just train them. Not nearly as compelling as other Toys to Life products, where you scan the character and can play as them instantly, but that's not what Nintendo wanted Amiibo to be. They wanted them to work across numerous games and not lock substantial content behind the figures, and consumers weren't pressured to buy them. And if there was one thing Nintendo was good at this generation, it was stopping consumers from buying their stuff. And finally, at the very end, we got footage of Shigeru Miyamoto playing and Nintendo Soft announced a new Star Fox for Wii U, but it was in such an early state they had to censor it. Now, this was leaked like an hour or so before the digital event premiered. Uh, some press outlets got the inside scoop early and accidentally published their articles before the presentation, and these images are some of the clearest we were really able to see of this game. Wow! Star Fox was right there alongside F-Zero when it came to neglected Nintendo franchises fans constantly begged for but didn't actually care about. But it was still cool to see they were planning to do a new game on Wii U focusing heavily on the gamepad, which this was one of three projects Miyamoto discussed at the event with that focus. We got Project Guard and Project Giant Robot as well. The former being a tower defense game, and the latter being a Project Giant robot game. You build a robot on the gamepad and smack it around. I, I, I don't know. Project Guard seemed to be more fleshed out, with many reporting Star Fox Easter eggs in the demo, so it was expected to eventually be combined with the Star Fox project. But damn, that's not all, as a few games were showcased outside of the presentation. Mario vs. Donkey Kong. This was actually shown off at GDC 2014 as a tech demo for the Nintendo Web Framework, basically a way for developers to code their games in HTML5, the widely used coding language for websites, so this was a tool by Nintendo to make it easy for developers to bring simpler games to Wii U. Did it work? This was practically the only game that used it, but hey, it was confirmed to be a full-blown title at E3. It looked like Mario vs. Donkey Kong? and so does the worst person you know. The full-blown Art Academy, Pac-Man, and Smash Brothers. IGN revealed the M-rated third-person shooter Hack and Slash Devil's Third, which was originally supposed to be published by THQ for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, was now a Wii U exclusive published by Nintendo. Okay. Mario Party 10. Uh, hey all, Scott here. Wait, I, I I might actually be in a coma right now, and mentioning Mario Party 10 might actually be what ends me!